Right. Hello, and welcome to the Nebraska Library Commission's Public Library Accreditation Workshop for 2023. Um, I am Krista Porter. I am the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. In my department, of Library Development, I'm, I'm in charge of the accreditation program, so I'm who you will deal with um, throughout this whole process. Uh, in my department, we also handle public librarian certification, board certification, um, E-rate, any of your continuing education uh, needs, our basic skills program, youth services, Grants, we give out grants in, our, in library development. So that is what we do um, here, and that's what I'm involved in. Uh, some of you I see, I've looked up everyone who is registering today and joining us. Uh, some of you are up for a renewal this year. That's great. Uh, good to get on top of things. Uh, some of you in future years, and that is awesome too. It's great to get a head start on, um, on this kind of thing. Um, it can take some time to gather what you need for some of the accreditation requirements um, and just to you know see where you're where you're situated right now and looking ahead to that. So it's great to get a head start. Um, we may have library directors, board members, community members here. That's awesome. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's good to have um, lots of people involved in the process, not just the library director. So um, hopefully if you are, um, are the director and are attending today, you are welcome to, after this is over, share the recording of the workshop with anyone else who may be um, helping you out with accredit getting up to date on your accreditation. Um, but we also have some people here possibly who have not been accredited yet. Um, the library is not currently accredited and that's that's great. We always love to have new libraries uh, uh, join the program and become accredited. We do have about 270 something public libraries in Nebraska and at the moment I believe 183, 80, 183 are currently accredited. So um, there are still plenty out there. We'd love to have new libraries join. So in the workshop today, it's going to be good for everyone. If you've gone through the process before, it's great to have a reminder of how things are done or of any changes that we maybe have put into the program since last time you had to do your accreditation. Um, and if you're brand new to the program or you're a brand new staff person at your library, um, we're going to do everything, all the basics and everything you need to know about being accredited. Um, it is a three-hour workshop, and we will take a break about halfway through. So um, it's okay. <laughs> um, you're not going to sit here for three hours and listen to me talk. We will take a break for everyone halfway through the session. All right, so I'm going to start here on our, this is the Nebraska Library Commission's website, uh, nlc.nebraska.gov. And if you go there, uh, you'll see here over on the left, we have um, menus. Uh, I'll pull out menu here that have pop out menu, um, extra information on them. And we have here accreditation and certification are together on one uh, pop out menu. And this is because they are related. Uh, we are going to talk about all three of these things today. Of course. Sorry, I just want to mute myself for a minute or so there. A uh, fire truck just went by, loud, loud sirens. I didn't want anyone to have to be uh, listening to that and struggling to hear me. All right. So on our menu here, you see accreditation and certification uh, pop out. And they are here together because they are related. Board certification and librarian certification fee are part of the requirements for your library to be accredited. And we're going to talk about all of them, but we are going to talk about um, accreditation first. Uh, and some people do um, confuse the terms here, um, certification, accreditation. You, and, and when I get emails or, or phone calls, sometimes um, it's can, you can be confused about what they're talking about, whether it's their, their personal certification, a library's accreditation. Um, my predecessor here, Richard Miller, used to describe it as people are certifiable, but buildings are not. <laughs> So uh, your board is certified, your library board is certified, your library director or any other library staff are certified, and your library is accredited. So people get certified, the library gets accredited. Um, 
So we are going to go to the library accreditations page first. Uh, I just do want to show you here, there are links to some of the sections with um, about cert board, library board certification and librarian certification. And we'll go into the details about all of that when we um, get, get back to talking about those. But for library accreditation, we have a link to the main page, the application form that we're going to look at, the basic guidelines, um, looking up your libraries or any library's public library accreditation status, and your community needs response planning that is required for this. So I'm going to go to the library accreditation website, and you can see here right at the top, it says accreditation process starts July 1st. Um, and that is correct. That is when I will send an email out to all of you up for reaccreditation or anyone who is um, qualified to be accredited, letting you know that you can go in and start working on your application, on your online application form. However, there are things you can do before July 1st and that you may need to do in preparation for when that process does open up. And that's why we do our workshops a couple of months ahead of time as we are doing now. So the first thing I do want to explain about public library accreditation here is this is not a national program that is created or dictated by any uh, national organization. Um, not from the American Library, so ALA, the American Library Association, or IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Services um, at the federal level. Um, this is not a national program run by them, any of them. It's done at the state level. So uh, we at the Library Commission created this program. Um, it is ours and we are in charge of it. There's no one telling me above me uh, what to do with this. Uh, not all states do this. Um, so if you come, have come from, to Nebraska from some other state, you may not know what this is about at all because your state does not have accreditation um, or certification for the library boards and um, library staff. Uh, some do accreditation, but not certification. Some do certification, but not accreditation of their libraries. It varies all across the country. Like I said, there's no organization telling everyone you must do this in the state. Each state does whatever they want to. Um, so. If you talk to your colleagues in other states about this, they may not have any clue what you're talking about because um, they don't have they don't have it as all, or their program may be completely different from how ours works. So this is specific just to Nebraska, and we here do do both. We have our board certification, librarian certification, and accreditation program. Um, all of these programs are voluntary. Uh, you are not required to participate in any of them, but there are certain benefits you get uh, because you have participated. Okay, so uh, there have been a few changes made to the program also recently, just last year. The current incarnation of the accredit, well, I'll go even back before that. Public library accreditation was first set up here in Nebraska in the late 80s. Uh, and it was a, um, and it has changed over the years. They made some modifications to it, of course, if, as times have changed. And the most recent change to it was done in 2013 when we went to a points based system. Uh, before 2013, um, the accreditation process, there were three levels and you had to meet all the criteria for the lowest level and do all of these things that were required before you could attempt to be at the second level. And then you had to meet all of those requirements before you could work on being at the, the highest level. Uh, if you didn't meet all the, even just one, if you missed just one guideline at the very lowest level, you didn't get your accreditation at all. Uh, they decided this was the, the, a, a team um, of librarians, library staff, and library regional system directors got were gathered together to do um, a reworking of the program in 2013 uh, to make it easier. Uh, that was really cutting off a lot of libraries who are perfectly good libraries, doing doing great work in their areas and their communities, but just due to one thing, um, they weren't getting their accreditation. So they changed to a points-based system where every guideline you can earn a certain number of points for. And uh, if you get the minimum number of points, you get the lowest level accreditation, you earn more points, next level, and so on. Uh, each community 
in the state is different and each community has different needs and each library has their own strengths um, and weaknesses. And so if one library is really good at doing one thing and this other library is good at doing something else, they should both be able to earn points for those things. You might not earn points for the thing that this other library is good at, but you're earning them for what you're good at and what you know your community needs. So it was much more equitable to have this point system rather than a hard line of, you must be open this many hours, you must have this many materials, you must, da, 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 da. so um, it's a much more flexible program. So that was changed in 2013. As of now, almost every single library in the state has been through that process at least once, many, most of them twice in the new version. And we've learned a lot about the accreditation program through that. Uh, and I had been talking about for quite a few years that I wanted to do a self, another self-evaluation of the program. They made the changes in 2013 and we've been using them for a while, but we hadn't really looked into it to see, is it working? Um, is this what we want to be, the information we want to get from the libraries? Are they happy with it? Is it actually helping them in doing what they do? Um, you could come up with a plan, uh, but when it goes into practice, you never know how it's going to actually turn out. <laughs> uh, so we did do this finally last year in uh, January of 2022. I brought, uh, brought together a public library accreditation review committee, which was made up of library directors. Um, some of them had been at uh, in the, involved in the planning in the reevaluate. Re, uh, changing of the program back in 2013. Some were new, had not been involved, and all of our regional, um, regional library system directors were involved as well. Uh, we had a couple of meetings and did a self-evaluation and a review of the program. We went through the application form uh, question by question, and we went through the uh, uh, community needs response plan process step by step to see what should be changed, what um, modifications would be good. And as, I, as we go through the workshop today, I will, point out things that have changed in case maybe you had been looking at this years ago and wonder, hey, something's different. I'll point that out. Oh. One of the major changes was, and it's right here up at the, well, at the top of the page here, is that public library accreditation is now good for five years. Previously, the accreditation period was three years, and we heard from many libraries over the years that that was not enough time. Uh, between having this valuation done. Not enough time for things to have changed in their community, for the demographics to be different, their, you know, their census data to change drastically, um, to come up with new goals and new programs and new things that they might mention in their community needs um, plan. Uh, the needs of the community hadn't changed a lot in three years. Um, it was just too soon. So I was getting a lot of repetitious things, the same thing in every, every, every time a library accredited. So we decided to extend that, change that from three to five years. We actually fell into that uh, um, automatically due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, back in 2020, we were um, in March. I was just starting to think about getting the new program, the accreditation process going for that year. And then the pandemic hit. And I decided uh, libraries did not need to be worrying about accreditation with everything else going on in the world that they were dealing with. This was not important enough to worry about. And I gave every library a year extension. So from whatever their Whenever they were due, everyone got an additional year added on to their accreditation. Um, in 2021 came around, things were still still bad. <laughs> and so uh, with the pandemic, so I gave everyone another year extension. So every library got two year extension on their accreditation um, because of the pandemic. Um, and then in 2022 decided, okay, Looks like people have, have settled into how they're running things in the library. Yes, we do still have uh, the COVID-19 pandemic going on um, as we do today, but people have figured out and, and settled in how they work with it now. So in 2022, we did start up the accreditation program again, but I brought this group together to do that self-evaluation first. Um, and then the first thing we did was put it to five years. Um, so everyone ended up with five years anyways, who were due back in 2020 uh, originally, and everyone else received even more time. Um, when we had it at three years, I had uh, three groups of libraries of about the same uh, 
number of libraries in each group uh, that I would hit, take care that would be up for reaccreditation each year. When we went to five years, I had to divide into five groups. So we'd have about the same number of libraries that I would be working with each year, somewhere between 35 and 40, it is depending on the year. Uh, so uh, when we did uh, switch from three to five, um, many libraries also had their accreditation extended again, just in order to fit a not the same number of libraries in each, in each group. So some libraries may even for this time around have like a six or seven years before they're due. It was just to get everything balanced out. Uh, you all have and been, everyone has sent emails letting them know what their accreditation expiration um, date was. And you can also look this up on um, the website. Uh, we do have a link here. And as you saw, it was in that pop pullout menu too, where you can look up accreditation status of any library in Nebraska. Uh, the, so we've got the city library name, what level they are at, when they expire, and which regional library system they are part of. Um, these links here will go to a library's website if we know what they that they have one. So if you're not sure <laughs> what your accreditation year is, we can't if you don't have that email from me from before, just go to this page here. We keep it up to date um, as as anything changes. Um, so everybody will know when they are due for for re-accreditation if they're currently accredited. For the libraries that are not accredited, it's just blank because they haven't done it yet. All right, so that three to five years was the biggest biggest change. There's also a pretty uh, substantial change to one part of the community's response plan that we will talk about when we get to that. Um, just a, um, a teaser, you don't have to do a SWOT analysis anymore. Yay. I know lots of people struggled with that. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We changed that. So um, we'll talk about that when we get into looking at the community's response planning later on. Um, and there are also some other changes, updates, and clarifications made to some of the guidelines in the application form. Uh, in our discussions, we you know, figured out, and, and from my, from the team, that the, the review team we had together, and just with, over the years as I worked with libraries, uh, things that I knew people were struggling with. And so there's some minor changes and clarifications in there. And the, and the application form that we'll talk about too. So the first thing that I try to tell people and that some people ask me when they are doing this for the first time or being reaccredited is why? Why should I go through this process? Why, why should my library be accredited? Why should I go through all of this work? You may have people asking you, your uh, mayor, your city council, your library board members may be asking you as the library director or staff, why are we doing this? What's the point? This is a lot for you to do. Is it even worth it? <laughs> um, and of course, I think it is. But uh, the main purpose of public library accreditation is to set standards, um, minimum standards, benchmark, benchmarks that library libraries reach. Um, and it shows your community that you are um, keeping up with the times and um, they know that you know compared to other like they can see compared to other libraries how you are doing and it just shows that you are working to keep the library as a good um, useful place for the citizens um, it is something as I wrote here to be really proud of um, and to celebrate from tell everyone spread the word when you do get accredited or if you come to get bumped up to a if you earn a higher level even so it's the standards are also created by a task force of professional librarians. Your colleagues create, come up, came up with these standards, decided this is what, you know, what is the minimum to be a, really, a good library in Nebraska? What do we want a library to do uh, to earn accreditation? And what can they reach for um, in the, with these benchmarks um, and these standards? So you can also tell people, this is, this is my colleagues and other librarians who have discussed this and come up with all of these um, criteria. Um, you also can show that how you are spending the money and the services you are providing and what what you are um, offering at the library is what is needed in your community because you've gone through this process to figure that out. Uh, you can show how you compare to other libraries who are similar in size to yours or even completely different from yours <laughs> and uh, show them that this is you know what other libraries are doing. So we probably should be too. 
So bragging rights, really, saying, hey, we're accredited. Uh, you can share this with your with your stakeholders, anyone involved with you know giving you money or at least are advocating for the library. Uh, you also receive some uh, physical things. <laughs> we do send you a certificate, an actual document that you can hang up on your wall. I know many libraries do this, and they always want to make sure they have the most recent one. So a certificate you can post up in the library. Uh, we send you a little graphic and online badge, a little thing that says Nebraska Public Library accredited and what years it's for. Uh, that you can use and post on your website, uh, share on your on your social media, put in any documents, flyers, anything you print out anywhere you want to. And we have window clings that go out, you can put in your window. Our regional library systems um, provide those. Uh, so you um, can have something right in the window of your library when someone just walking by on the street can see, hey, this is an accredited library by the state of Nebraska. Awesome. So beyond all of that, um, money. <laughs> Uh, budgets are tight, budgets are important, and we know that. Uh, there are certain things that you are eligible, certain funding and monies that you are eligible for as an accredited public library in Nebraska. If you are not accredited, you are not eligible for these. Uh, the first one is state aid to public libraries. This is based on your population, and you can only receive the state aid funding if you are accredited. There is another program called Dollars for Data that you may know about that for any library that just submits, that submits the public library survey every year to Sam Shaw, um, and but is not accredited, you do get, you can receive dollars to, for data funding monies, but that is less than what you receive as state aid if you are accredited. Um, in addition, we have um, some incentive payments if you reach the second or third level of silver or gold. Uh, you can, you'll can get an additional $200 if you're silver and $400 if you're gold. This is money that you can do whatever you like with, state aid, just money that we will send out to you in the beginning of the year, early in the year. Um, also, you are eligible to apply for the grants that we offer here through the Nebraska Library Commission. So that's our CE and training grants, internship, library improvement grants, and youth grants for excellence. Um, so to apply for all of our grants here at the commission, your library does need to be accredited. Now, I will mention that last year was um, the rules were waived for some of this. Uh, we received funding here at the Library Commission from the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA. And that was also as a result, money that came as a result of the pandemic going on. And we were, um, we had to have all of our, any money we were gonna be giving out to libraries had to be eligible, um, any library in the state had to be eligible for it. So our only criteria last year was that you are a legally established library. Uh, did not need to be accredited. Uh, so for the library improvement grants and the youth grants for excellence, we did use ARPA funding to fund those last year. We had uh, something like $2.4 million, I'm guessing, remembering. So last year for one time only, we did, you did not need to be accredited to apply for our grants. Um, but we do not have that money again this year. That was a one year, the one time thing. There is not a new uh, Rescue Plan Act money or, any, or a new act or anything coming through this year. So we are back to our regular rules <clears throat> starting in 20, with our 2023 grants, which libraries applied for last fall and, are, and have received or are receiving right now. So for our 2022 grants, you did not need to be accredited. But like I said, that was a one shot deal <laughs> unless we get money again that gives us those requirements, uh, we won't be able to do that again. Um, in addition to our grants, there are some other state agencies, state organizations that have decided to use our accreditation um, level, our accreditation process as a requirement for, to use library accreditation as a requirement for their grants. Uh, Nebraska's Department of Economic Development has community development block grants, and the rural USDA agency in Nebraska has grants and loans as well. And both of those have decided to use as one of their criteria that a library, a public library, if a public library is applying, they must be accredited. Uh, for both of these, as you see here, I noted they are for community facilities. So if you are looking for construction, type grant monies, something to related to construction. These are two grants I highly recommend you look into. Uh, so if you need are doing building a new library building or adding expansion onto yours, your current building, or updating like your computer lab, anything that has to do with construction and modifying the building, putting in ADA accessible doors, those kind of things, excuse me, um, those are two grants that you can apply for. 
the grants that we give out, we do have, a, because of the money where it comes from, can't be used. The commission gives out cannot be used for construction type things like that. But those other ones can. So um, receiving all of these funds, um, you do need to be accredited. If you are not an accredited public library, you cannot apply for these grants and you did not receive this, uh, the higher state aid funding. All right. Uh, there are three levels of accreditation, uh, bronze, silver, and gold. And as I mentioned earlier, the accreditation program is based on um, earning points. And we'll see how you earn all those points when we look at the accreditation application form. Uh, there is a total of 275 points available, but gold is the highest level you can reach at 250. There's not like gold plus or platinum or anything. Um, but if you reach 175, you get bronze, 200 points, silver, silver and 250 gold. Uh, and when this, and I will tell the story that I was told when this was, they were first coming up with this bronze, silver, and gold levels in 2013, someone did make the joke actually that uh, though the Olympics were happening at that time. And they said, oh, we should do bronze, silver, and gold, like the medals. <laughs> and they all said, oh, actually, that's a great idea. <laughs> so they changed the levels and they call them bronze, silver, and gold. So that is where that came from. Um, so the points that you earn are for varying things, like I said, at your library that you may do, and it um, just makes it a more equitable program. Um, it reflects more accurately what is happening in each unique community. Uh, so if you earn points for one thing, that's because that's something your community needs and you're really good at, so you get those points, but some other community doesn't need that particular service, so they don't earn those points, they earn something else. And, but overall, everyone can still earn points in what they're good at and get up to whichever level um, they can reach. Um, and I already showed you how you can look up your library's accreditation level right now um, or any other library. Um, if you have any questions, don't forget, type it into the question section for anything you want to ask me. If I'm going too fast, if you're confused about anything, if I'm not, I haven't mentioned something that you thought you, I would mention, um, whenever you think about it, just go right ahead and type it in there. So as I mentioned at the beginning, and it showed at the top of this page, the accreditation process officially begins in July of each year. July 1st, I send an email out to all libraries who are due for reaccreditation this year and any libraries who are not accredited but have submitted our public, the public library survey and the supplemental survey that we have here at the Library Commission. Uh, those are the surveys that you work with, with Sam Shaw on using Bibliostat Collect. So uh, you, I'm sure all of you have dealt with him before. Uh, but if you submit those surveys, he lets me know. And then all those people who have submitted that also are invited to become accredited for the first time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the process starts in July. Then you have to submit an online accreditation application form where you add up, you check off boxes for earning all your points and a community needs response plan. This is a separate document that you will write up uh, or maybe update a current one that you have that you would send, you would send to me. Um, do it in Word, um, PDF, whatever works for you. And you can email it, mail it, scan and fax it, whatever works for you to get it to me. Uh, both of those things are due by October 1st. And that's, so that's a deadline to submit both of those items. And then at the very latest, December 31st is when I will have wrapped up evaluating all of the applications and plans and let you know what your accreditation level is. <clears throat> Um, I do not wait till October 1st to start looking at these. Uh, as soon as I receive an, a plan, an application and a plan, and I have both of those together, I'll start evaluating them and looking, reviewing them and looking them over. Um, I do need both of those things to start that review because there are things in the accreditation application form online, some boxes that you will check off that refer to things that would be mentioned in your plan. And so there should be things in your plan that you're checking off in your application form. So I look at both of those together to make sure if you mentioned this thing in your plan, make sure you checked it off on your application form. And if you check something off in your application form saying you're doing this thing, I will check your plan to make sure you said you were. Um, I may reach out to you with questions. Um, if there is something missing from your plan or missing from your application form that I know should be done or something you checked off that I'm not sure about, I will I could reach out to you and we will have a back and forth 
um, and updating the application form, updating the plan until we come up with something that is um, correct and um, useful and what we both want and before I finish up the evaluation. So even when you submit both of those things, they are not locked in stone and can't be changed. We can make up, of course, I can have you make modifications to your plan and your online application form, even after you do your final submission, we can still make changes behind the scenes if we determine that you should have checked something off and earned more points, or if you had unfortunately checked something that you shouldn't have, we have to undo that. Things can always be modified until we come up with our final answer. So you could, on July 1st, when I send the email, if you're really on top of things, uh, complete your application form and email me your plan. And within a week or so, you know, give me time to, to look over everything, you could know what you're accredited, that you're accredited and you're good for the next five-year period, possibly by, by you know, beginning of July. Um, but it could happen any time between July 1st and December 31st, depending on how much you have to work with libraries. Um, accreditation is done on the calendar year. So your current accreditation in, is good through December 31st of whatever year you're renewing. So we work on starting the next cycle while you're still currently accredited. <clears throat> All right, any questions about the schedule or levels or anything I've talked about so far? <clears throat> Excuse me. So there are some requirements to apply and to maintain your library's accreditation. Um, as I mentioned, you do have to, first thing you got to do before we even reach out to you about being accredited or re-accrediting is have that sub-public library survey and supplemental survey done. Those usually open up in November um, and then our, the deadline is usually sometime in February. So that is already done before we get into accreditation in July. So you have to have done both of those. If you miss uh, doing your survey for one year, we you may lose your library's accreditation. So you don't just do this the one year you're due and then not worry about it for another five years. You do have to keep up with submitting your survey every year and you have to keep any of the things you've said you do in your application and these 12 minimum qualifications I'm gonna get into, you do have to maintain all of those throughout the time of your um, accreditation of your library. Um, if we lose any of those, I will work with you and we'll talk about what's going on. Was there a reason? Um, was there a major um, disaster like the flooding we had in 2019? Gave a lot of libraries extensions and, and let them slide on things then. Uh, we'll have to talk, talk about why um, you may have missed something and if we will give you um, a pass on that. But if not, there will be, you could possibly have your accreditation revoked. So public library survey, supplemental survey, then there are 12 minimum qualifications that you have to meet before you can um, submit the application. Um, I'll open that up over here so you can see that. And we'll get into the details of this um, in, in a few minutes here. Uh, but these are the 12 things, and this is the beginning of getting into your app, the online application form. You can see there's a big red box saying the process won't start until July 1st. You can't do this just yet <laughs> because it's locked down until July 1st. As soon as it's July 1st, then we will I'll send you that email. It'll be made live, and you'll be able to go into it. I do have a version of this form that I'm going to show you that's a demo that I can get into behind the scenes because I'm, I'm doing it for this uh, training to show you everything. But we'll get into all these details in just a, a few minutes here. And then the other um, requirement is having that community needs response plan. Uh, this is something that used to be called a strategic plan. So your previous version of this may be called that, or you may hear people talk about the strategic plan they had to submit for accreditation. Uh, a few years ago, we ch I changed the name of that. That was before this self-evaluation thing I did last year. A lot of libraries were confused. A lot of staff was confused by this or intimidated by calling a strategic plan. Uh, strategic, and it really wasn't what we were looking for. A strategic plan is like your plan for everything you're going to do at your library. What we're looking for here is just something more focused and just a, a part of what you do at your library. Um, and one of our other regional library system directors, Scott Childers, he's the director of the Southeast System, said, well, I've been calling it as this community needs response plan, because that's really what it is. It was easier to explain it. And I 
light bulb went off. I said, that's awesome. I'm going to, can I borrow that? Yes, we're stealing it. We're changing the name. So it is now called a community needs response plan. Because really what we're asking you to do is look out in your community, see what's going on, what needs do they need, and is there anything you can respond to? So community needs response plan, much more, uh, reflects more accurately what we're at, what it is and what we're looking for. But you may still see strategic plan mentioned. And you may have a previous one that's called that. This is something, like I said, is a separate document. It's not something online that you submit. You'll write it up yourself, however you want it to be, and you will then send that to me. And it says your email, but I'll accept fax mail too. It doesn't matter. Just get it to me however it works for you. So those are the minimum qualifications for this is what you need to do to, before you can actually apply is you got to make sure you have that survey. Both of these surveys submitted, make sure you meet these 12 minimum qualifications and you've got this community's response plan that you get, you send to me. Um, we will get into the community's response plan in the second half of the workshop today. Uh, these, the guidelines in our application form are community-based, and that's why we have you look at your community and write up this separate plan for that. And so we're going to look at that in the second half today. Um, as I mentioned, the application form, it is not live yet. You can't log into yours yet, uh, but we will look at a demo uh, form of that, version of that. They, we do have, though, a preview application that you can look at if you want to see ahead of time what the questions will be. This is just a static form. It's nothing you can click on. It's not your form to submit. You can't even do anything live with it. It's just a static page showing what the questions are going that, that will appear when you go into your live form. So you can see here, this is exactly what it will look like when you go to live one. And But if you try and do anything and click on anything, I'm, I'm, I'm Honestly, I'm checking, I'm clicking my mouse. <laughs> you can't actually do anything with this. It just shows you these are the questions that will be asked and how many points they're worth. So um, this is good to look at ahead of time to see are there some things we can work on to earn more points. If we need more points to reach that bronze level or if we want to earn more points to get to um, a higher level. So you can um, take a look at this um, ahead of time. The preview application um, is always available for you to look over. All right, so the accreditation application form, we will get into, um, and like I said, look at the demo of that next. But first, I want to go back and go into these 12 minimum qualifications. So that open over here somewhere. Yeah, there we go. And go over these with you. Uh, please do ask any questions if you do have anything that you're confused about or not sure as I'm explaining it here in the application form because we're going to get into some of the details here and in talking about Nebraska statutes and things like that. So as you can see here it says you must meet these 12 minimum qualifications before you can even apply to be accredited for this first time or be re-accredited. You have to still be meeting these. Uh, many of these requirements and some things that mention the form are come from Nebraska state statutes. There are certain Nebraska laws that libraries have to follow. And we have a, a question mark here, a little yellow, which is a link that you can open up. And this is a help page with links to anything you, you may need to learn, know more about on the um, these minimum qualifications. And if you scroll down this page, and we'll look at these more closely in just a minute or two here, we get into the actual, the rest of the accreditation form itself. So we have links here to the Nebraska statutes, uh, federal laws, Open Meetings Act laws, information on being certified, et cetera, et cetera. All of these different things, we have a help here. So if there's something you need to know, know more about or you're confused about, you can always open up that and look at that when you are actually going through your application. So the first thing you, so these 12 boxes you have to check off and once you check them all off, then it let, let you access the online application form. So first thing is you need to be legally established by Nebraska, under Nebraska state statutes. Uh, there are, um, this is chapter 51 is the main uh, chapter uh, part of the Nebraska 
law that refers to public libraries. There's a few things elsewhere in the laws too that relate to libraries, but this is the main one. And to be legally established, you had to have an ordinance, a resolution, something that came from your municipality, whether it's your city, village, township, county, stating that we want to have a public library. We are going to create a public library. Uh, this is something that could have been done last year if you're new or 100 years ago if you know your ladies book club decided to become a public library just something that came officially from this from your municipality and you have to have a library board uh, that is made up of at least minimum five members that is in nebraska state statutes that public library boards have to have a minimum of five members um, those two things are legally, legally established i will say it is not required that every public library in Nebraska be legally established. You can have a public library in your community that is volunteer run, that doesn't have a, a full board, um, that just, you know, for just because, you know, this community wanted to come together and have a library, and that is perfectly fine. We welcome that. Uh, you, you were happy to have as many libraries as the state needs. Um, you just do need to go be sure you follow those legally established in order to become accredited. Um, and to do some other things with the library commission that you can look into on your own if you want to. Um, but yes, public libraries, volunteer libraries are perfectly acceptable. It's not a problem. It's not illegal or anything. You're allowed to do that, uh, but you do need to be legal uh, in order to go into the accreditation process. And then, uh, the next qualification, you do need to comply with all Nebraska related library laws, any other local laws in your community that may um, be, may affect you um, from your community and any other federal laws that um, like that may affect. This would be things like um, statutes, Open Meeting Act laws, confidential, confidentiality <laughs> of library records, of Americans with Disabilities Act, all of these various things are things that are related to you as a library that you do need to make sure you are in compliance with and various federal laws, secure safety, things like that. You do have to have that library board. It could be governing or advisory, depending on the size of a community, having the minimum of five members and that you do follow the, um, there are certain, like I said, certain state statutes that refer to library boards and how they are run. Um, and you have to, that the board has to follow the Nebraska open meetings law. And we have links in that help page about that link to the open, the actual open meetings law statute here. So you can read up on that. Uh, we did just a year ago, we did a one of my weekly Encompass Live webinars about the Open Meetings Act. And we we're doing an update on that coming up. Let me get the right date. On July 19th, if you want to watch that. And we are also doing a new session on June 21st about Nebraska library laws. So June 21st, Encompass Live on Nebraska library laws. July 19th, Encompass Live on the Open Meetings Act. Uh, Scott Childers and I will be doing those two sessions. So if you want a more in-depth information about laws, in Nebraska library laws, and then specifically the Open Meetings Act, uh, do sign up for those. They will be recorded and you can watch them later too. Uh, the next two sex, uh, requirements here are about certification that we had mentioned earlier. Both your library board and your library director are required to be certified. Um, and this is certified through the Nebraska Library Commission's program. So I'm going to go back over here to our main Nebraska Library uh, main page here, and we're going to go into looking at board and librarian certification. <clears throat> And you can see here for each section, we do have a main page for each of them. There is an application form for your board to be certified and an application form for your library director or any library staff to be certified. We do have where you can look up your library board status or your own status as, as far as your, how, how are you going along on your certification. Um, how you can sub you can submit your continuing education credits for your board and submit them for your library director or staff. They are different forms. And then we also have some great guides we've put together um, with um, Holly Duggan, who's our CE coordinator and previous staff have worked to put together a library board manual and a director's guidebook. These are both great resources, uh, basically a how-to guide on how to be a good how to be a library board and how to be a library director and how they work together. 
So I highly recommend taking a look at those two documents um, whenever you need more information about what are we supposed to be doing. So I'm going to start with a board certification because it's first on the list here and go to the Public Library Board certification um, page. So the purpose of uh, both of these certification programs is to um, keep you effective as a board member and or as a library staff person. The library board, it's to make sure that you know what's going on as far as being a library board member, that you're up to date on any new things going on in the world of libraries. Uh, we know library board members come on and off. Um, sometimes they're like a limited time that you can be a board member. So new members will need to you know, keep up to date on things. This is about um, Lifelong, lear lifelong learning and professional development, keeping up to speed on what's going on in your the area you're supposed to be an expert in. Um, each uh, library, your library board has, and the library board periods are for three years certification periods. So this is still three year. So you are, um, and in that three year period, your library board has to do 20 hours of continuing education credit. Of continuing education work submit 20 hours now this is 20 hours as a whole not 20 hours per person over a three-year period so if you have the minimum of five board members you may have more um, each board member has to do four hours of CE in three years easy not a problem um, I recommend spreading it out over those three years uh, um, so you're not trying to rush through all of them at the, when you're up for recertification. Uh, as I said, you do have to apply for certification. So you do have to submit this form first to let us know that your board is working and doing CE that's related to being certified. Uh, you may, If you submit certification re reports to us and we don't know why, we don't have anything showing that your board has officially decided to join the program, we don't have any way of applying it to, to your board. So do this certification application first. Um, then you can start submitting CE activity. There is a CE um, form where your boards will use to submit anything your board members attend. Uh, you just do the library name and you can list multiple activities on one form. Uh, your board can submit this, the library director can submit this, whoever. Uh, what I love about this form too though is that you can list multiple board members attending the same activity um, all together. You don't have to list it like if four board members did something, you don't have to list that activity four times. You list it once and then you list all the four members here. Um, and that's something to be aware of too when we're talking about earning continuing education credit. If all of your board members, for example, attend the Nebraska Laws and Compass Live we have coming up, um, you list that they attended that, you list all of them, and they each earn an hour of credit for attending that. So if all five of your board members watch that one Encompass Live show, they've earned five hours of CE for their board. They're a quarter of the way done from just one hour of them all sitting together and watching that webinar. And I'll leave that page. Uh, you can check your library board certification status. There is a link here for that, similar to looking up your library's accreditation status. Um, this is ranged by city by default, but you can change it to name, system, expiration date. It tells you if their board is certified, when they expire, and which regional system they're in. These, um, if a library has expired and has not kept up with their certification, that's what it's in red, and you can see the dates are old. These links, um, here go to the library board's certification record. Unlike the one on the accreditation page where it went to the, just the library's website, this is where you look at the record. So you can see here for Ainsworth, they are halfway through what they need for CE. It tells you they've got currently have earned 10, they need 10. Their, um, re their recertification is due September 30th, 2024. So they have until September of next year to earn those um, other 10 credits. And you can see here it lists the things that they've attended, when it happened, and how many CE they earned. And I think the, this is the uh, initials of whoever attended. Uh, we also have down here a list of who we have, who we know are your current board members. This is based off of what you would have submitted to us in the supplemental survey. Um, the NLC Supplemental Survey. Um, if any of this is incorrect, let us know and we will update that and fix it and, and have the correct names here. 
So your board can always look up here and check and see where they're at and how many hours they might need or if they've met them all. You as a library director can come here and check. This is just um, public information. I just, this is not something hidden away. So you can always double check here and see how your board is doing. So what can you, your board do to earn these credits? Um, all sorts of things, uh, webinar, workshop, conferences, um, online, in-person, recorded, any version of that you can earn CE for. Uh, you earn um, a half a CE for anything that goes minimum 20 minutes, something has to be um, up to 44 minutes, you earn half a CE, once it goes past 45, you earn uh, the full one um, CE up to 89 minutes. Um, anything that we provide here through the Library Commission or through the systems is eligible for boards to attend. Uh, beyond that, it has to be something that's related to what you do, your job as a board member. Um, what things that will help you do, do be, you know, perform your duties as a library board member. Uh, you may be a school teacher and attend professional development and CE that's related to doing your job as a teacher, and that's great, but that has nothing to do with being a board member at your library, so you can't submit that kind of CE for this. Um, if you have questions about what was eligible and if it does count, contact Holly, Holly Duggan, our CE coordinator, and she can let you know if she'll accept it or not. She's in charge of this. We also have a lot of links to a lot of uh, board-specific uh, courses and trainings in here that you can um, have your board watch. Uh, trustee Academy courses and short takes for trustees. These are through United for Libraries, which is the American Library Association section for friends, foundations, trustees, which are library boards. Um, here in Nebraska, we pay for a statewide subscription to United for Libraries. Anything they offer, um, the Library Commission pays, pays for that. And all library staff and board members in Nebraska can attend and use anything in the library, United for Libraries website for free. At no cost to you, we cover the cost. Uh, you just create your own login here. There's a link here for that. And then you have your own record, your own account with their system to access anything that they offer. So the Trustee Academy has some of these courses, working with the library director, everyday advocacy, equity, diversity, inclusion, et cetera, et cetera, all the kind of things that a board may do. Uh, short takes for trustees are shorter ones, a little eight to 10 minutes each. So you would watch these and then have a discussion about it afterwards to fulfill that 20 minute minimum of receiving CE for anything. So these are things that you could um, at a board meeting decide we're gonna go through the first one of these, maybe just go through them one at a time and start earning our CE for this. So if you watch what it um, means to be a trustee, talk about it, all five board members do it. Um, they can each earn that half a credit and that's two and a half CE that you've earned for that particular item. We also have links to some great resources that other states have put together and put out there that are that you can watch. Uh, Pennsylvania and Wyoming have their own trustee and library board um, videos out there, so you can watch any of those. And then um, other Encompass Live sessions that we have had over the years that would be eligible as well, specific Encompass Live sessions. Well, this is just highlighting specific ones that are board focused. So if you want to really make sure your board members are learning things about that, Holly has pulled together a lot of those here. Um, United for Libraries also does lots of other events. They have a monthly learning live webinar series that's got lots of things that are board related. Um, they do an annual virtual conference. I believe there's one coming up for 2023. Um, we'll have to see about, we'll get, um, I'm not exactly sure when that, I think it's in August each year. Um, but these are all things that you can attend that come through. Um, United for Libraries. Ah, okay, and we have a question here, great, uh, about library board. Uh, the question here is the board just completes the continuing education, continuing ed hours mentioned, and there's no other form to complete. Right, the board, first you have to just sign up using this form saying, yes, we want to be part of the certification program. And then when you submit any of the, do any of the continuing education um, things, you submit the activity on this form, letting us know you attended something. Um, 
anything that you attend through the library commission we track that for you like today if you had board members attending anything live i've got a list here where i've checked off all of you that are here and i pass that on to holly uh and mary geibel our assistant to record all of that but anything you attend that's not run by the commission or that's recording um you use that form to submit um, and then a second question here, does United for Libraries still publish a newsletter? I believe that they do. And if you go into there, um, and you do have access to that as part of the United, the statewide account that we have here. Um, I was gonna go to the ALA website, trustee training. Um, and you can, you can access any of their publications when you log into your account in United for Libraries for being a Nebraska library staff person. Okay, I think I got through all of this. Yes, all right. And at the bottom of this page are some FAQs that explain a lot of what I just um, went through, um, went over with you. So that is your board certification. So to be accredited, your library board does need to be current on their certification. Um, any other questions about board certification before we go on to librarian certification? All right. So I'm gonna go over to the public librarian certification page here. Your library director also needs to be certified in order for your library to be accredited. Um, other staff can be certified as well, and you will earn extra points for them if they do become certified. Uh, libraries, and this is the same thing as library boards, is professional development, keeping up with what's going on in your profession, um, knowing what's happening and just keeping you know on top of things like that. Um, you also have to submit an application to the program, so we know that you are submitting CE to us for the purpose of being certified. So you have to submit this form first if you haven't done it yet, um, the first thing you do need to do. And then you will get a certificate that will be sent to you, and there's also a three-year period that your um, librarian certification is good for. There are different levels of certification based on your education. The, so if you have a library science degree, you end up with the levels that have that little L after that, two L. If you don't, if you have any other kind of degree, you just receive that level. Um, if you do not have any sort of library science education that you've done, we do require you to uh, do our basic skills courses instead. Uh, we know that not every library staff person um, is not every library staff person in Nebraska has attended library school or even intends or has the desire or need to attend full library school, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, we are happy to have you all working in libraries, but if you want to be accredited, we have our basic skills courses that you will need to take in order to earn your certification. The basic skills classes are basically um, the how to be a library staff person, the most important things you need to know, collection development, communication, intellectual freedom, et cetera. There's six courses that are required to take, and then you can choose out of these 10 courses, seven electives, depending on what you're interested in or, or need to know more about. We have a schedule of our courses, basic skills courses. They're done throughout the year. Um, and they're always at this same time of year and in this order. So you can plan uh, when, what year you might take these courses if you need to. Um, as I said, the certification period goes for three years. So over that, if you are, do not already have some sort of library degree within that first three year, the first three years of your certification, you have to do basic skills classes. So you'll have to do those six um, required ones and seven electives sometime in the first three years. Once you do them once, you don't have to do them again. After that, you just have to earn CE credits. Uh, so um, I'd say look at this schedule and decide what year you might be doing which ones. Uh, you may know that in July I'm going on vacation this year, so reference isn't going to happen in 2023, but you can plan to do it in 2024 or 2025. Um, these basic skills classes are actually open to any Nebraska citizen who is working in a library or thinking they might work in a library, planning to work in a library. They are free. There's no cost. They're all done online through Moodle, which is an online learning management system. 
Uh, some of them are self-paced, as you can see here, and they last a month long. So you have a month to do all of the work in our communication and intro to cataloging ones. All the other ones are two weeks, and they do have an instructor that, instructor that helps you move you along through the class. So if you do need to do basic skills classes, here's the information about that. Um, if you're just interested and want to take one, you can as well. You know, as I said, they're required if you want to be certified and don't have a library degree or schooling of any kind. But if you just need to know more about programming outreach, maybe you're a new outreach librarian and you're like, I don't know what to do, go ahead and take the class when it comes up. Um, you're welcome to take any of these and you can take them repeatedly if you really want to, just for your own education. We do update them regularly, of course, as things change. So if you took one of these like 10 years ago, you might want to take a new uh, what it again to see what the update is. Um, for librarian certification, you do need to do um, 45 hours of CE credits over your three year, over during your three year certification period. If you have, um, yeah, if you, are doing the basic skills classes because you do not have the library science degree, your basic skills classes count towards that 45. So you don't have to do the basic skills plus 45 hours. Any of those classes you take will count towards your total of the 45 hours. So for um, librarians doing certification, it's 45 credits over a three year period. So you only need to do 15 hours a year. That shouldn't be bad at all. Um, for accreditation, your library director is required to be certified at the level, at a certain level, and the levels are based on your library's legal service area. And if I have the, where is it here? Ah, help page, there it is. <laughs> I knew it was here somewhere. Uh, the director, depending on the, the legal service area of your community, you need to be at a minimum of these particular levels. So 500 to 24.99 level one at a minimum, et cetera, et cetera, 10,000 or plus level five, having a master's in library science. Uh, what can you do to be uh, certified? Oh, here we go, how do I earn? There we go. There's a whole page on uh, earning CE credits, a whole separate page for the public librarian credits. Uh, similar to the library board webinars, workshops, conferences. Um, in this case, you can take courses for college credit. The same rules apply for timing, um, online courses. Um, if you teach something, if you present, you actually earn double the CE credits. So if you go to the Nebraska Library Association conference and present, you're one of their, one of their sessions. Or if you, um, Go to the Association for Rural and Small Libraries conference coming up in Wichita this fall. And you're a presenter, you submit that to us, you earn double the CE. So you can earn continuing education for both learning something by attending a workshop and teaching other people something. Ah, new question here. Um, do other staff members need to be certified? No, there is not a requirement that any other staff members be certified. Only the director is required to be certified. Um, if other staff members are certified, you can earn more points in your certification. Uh, and uh, just like the board, as far as what you would earn CE credits for, it's things to do with being a library director. Um, and there is a, a specific form to submit, a different form to submit your CE activity if you are an individual doing the librarian certification. So if you attend something we're doing here, like you're doing today, I will submit it for you. If you attend something else, or if you attend a recording of something, you would use this form to submit your CE to, to us. There is a CE record review where you can check and see where you are at your certification. I can't show you this because I'd have to log into someone's account and I don't have that info. But um, so you can, as an individual, check and see how many hours you've done and how many hours you might need. Um, there is a password you use. You can look up here um, if, or you can email Mary Geibel and she'll help you as well. But you can look it up yourself. Uh, I'll also note here that when you submit your CE to us, it does, this is, it is not an automatic thing where it's just automatically added to your, instantaneously added to your CE record. It is done manually by Mary to go in and look at all the forms she's receiving and then add them. So give her at least 10 days to get your record updated. 
Um, if it's been like a month or more and you still don't see that reflected, just send her a quick email. Uh, things do get lost in the shuffle. She's very, very busy with a lot of these things being submitted. Uh, she does our CE for boards and libraries and sending out sort of certificates for everything. So um, just send her an email and say, hey, I sent this one in. Did you get it? Just make sure she didn't miss anything. For both the board and librarian certification, like I said, for the library accreditation, you will receive a certificate in the mail uh, showing that you are certified as, a, as the, your board is certified and a separate one showing your director or any of your staff are. Uh, another thing to brag about hanging up in your wall, I know some libraries are very, um, uh, want those always up to date and sometimes they've lost the most recent one or they didn't they didn't get it and they want to get an updated one so they have all their um, certificates up certificates up on the wall library is accredited the board certified the director certified great thing to brag about and show off and so show how your what your library is is doing all right any questions uh, any other questions about board or librarian certification what questions do you have that I did not mention yet? Or anything that you're confused about or you're wondering about, about certificate, either of those certification programs? <clears throat> All right. So the next qualification of the 12 minimum before you even get into the form, sorry, uh, you have to receive local funding from your municipality, city, village, township, whatever. So you have to have actual budget money coming from somewhere. Uh, you have to have done the most recent public library survey and supplemental survey. I already talked about that. You have to have paid library staff during all scheduled hours the library is open. Uh, now, I will mention here, we do know that sometimes you do have volunteers who come in and help out in the library or library board members will come in and help run the library sometimes for special circumstances and not be paid for it. Um, if the library director or staff is has to go um, off to a conference like NLA, Nebraska Library Association Conference or ALA, or has to go to a meeting um, and they don't wanna close the library and they bring volunteers in, that's perfectly fine. You can still have volunteers come in and help keep the library going. They just can't be your regular staff. So it would be like for special cases um, here and there is when you would have unpaid people come in and help um, keep the library running. And that's perfectly OK. Uh, the director has to have an email address, which is used and checked regularly. Um, now, this may sound like something weird to say to have as a criteria, but we had a lot of trouble in this in the past. And we do still have some library directors that are not regularly checking their email. So we're making that a criteria. This is how I re reach out to you. I send you an email on July 1st. When I have questions, I send you emails and you have to respond to those. If you don't and you just leave it empty, you may not get accredited. If you don't respond back to me and answer my questions on the email, that may be it. Okay. Uh, you do also, by state statute, have to make your basic services available for free. You cannot charge for basic things like um, borrowing materials, providing reference services, um, information, answering questions, also providing the internet at no charge to all users. That's the next one. This is in the state statutes that you have to do this for your residents who um, supply your tax support, meaning the residents in your legal service area. Um, this is something that someone asked me about in a previous session about what about when we have people that we, we have people pay for a non-resident card to use the library, is that okay? Yes, because those people are not residents that pay your tax support. That's why you're having them pay for a card and they're a non-resident user of your library. So it's perfectly okay to have people who are outside your tax area, whose money goes to run your library partially, and charge them to, buy, to get that card and then to use your library services. That is okay. Um, also, this is just basic services. Um, if you do need to charge for sometimes supplies for a... Um, a craft show, a craft event, or something. Uh, play. They you have them pay for the supplies to you know, the the filament to run to get something out of your 3D printer, uh, the vinyl from your if your Cricut, whatever. Um, all of that. It's okay to charge for those you know special things. It's just your basic services, circulation, general reference, internet that has to remain free for your um, residents. 
And the last item here is you have to make an annual report to the governing body, um, whoever is in charge of your uh, library. And this is something for state statute as well that's supposed to be done by February of every year for the previous year. Uh, you may make other reports throughout the year to them and that's fine, um, but like a general annual report for the previous uh, calendar year is supposed to be done by February of the next year. And you can see here, now that we have checked off all the boxes, it says based on this, since you said you agreed to all, you do all these, you meet the minimum qualifications and you can apply for accreditation. And then it will ask you to type in a username and password. You use the same Bibliostat username and password that you use to do your public library survey. We are not gonna make it come up, remember another, password. We don't want to have, to do, have you to have to do that. Um, if you don't know what yours is, we do have a look up here. Also, when I send that email on July 1st, I do include in that email what your library's username and password is. Um, and when you enter that in here, then you will go into your library's specific uh, application form. So we are going to pop back over here and talk about that application form. Uh, it is organized into those five categories, governance and planning, resources, services, cooperation, collaboration, and communications. Uh, some of the questions are pre-filled by the information in that public library survey, so you don't have to re-enter it. You can look at that preview application like I showed you earlier if you want to see what those these questions are. And we're gonna go through the full application now so you can see everything that's in there. Before I jump into there, I'm going to am going to talk about some of the questions that are done as peer comparisons. Um, previously, there were things like you had to be open a certain number of hours minimum. You had to circulate this many materials. You had to weed this many materials, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that was one of the things that was we got rid of when they changed to this point system. Um, so in addition to earning points for certain things, we also have certain criteria that are done by peer comparisons. We compare your library to other libraries that are in communities as the same size as yours. Uh, so this is rather than being just like, if you didn't, you're not open enough hours, you don't get that. It's okay, you just have to see, well, what are communities in my same size? How many hours are they open? Am I close to theirs? Great. Uh, your peers are 15% above or below your legal service area. Um, if there's not enough in Nebraska, which for many libraries there isn't, that are close to your size, we do expand out and use um, peers from other states like Iowa, Kansas, et cetera. Um, we get all of this data from those li their libraries, public library survey data, um, public library survey forms. All of that information is public. So, you know, you can always look up your public library survey data for Nebraska libraries on our website. We can look up other states. So Sam Shaw pulls all that data together for me and gives me who the peers are. Now we did have questions, we have had questions over the years and con con concerns that just looking at size of community was not um, correct in, for some libraries that, well, they're the same size as me, but they have three times the budget. How can I possibly compete with that and be compared? And we understand that. Uh, we did do some experimenting last year when I was doing this um, self-evaluation, and we did run some numbers of adding in other criteria, like budget or staff. Um, and it didn't really change who your peers were. You still had the same peers coming up. Uh, we also, we decided to stick with just, rather than have, making it so complex and all these different numbers that we've got to figure out and track, stick with the um, public legal service area. Uh, but uh, we do look at these as well. We don't just blindly say the same, that, that that's the only thing we look at. We do then look at all other things that are going on in this library. So we do notice, this one library has a crazy budget, way more than anyone else's. They are skewing the numbers off for everyone. We're just gonna remove them from the comparison. So it is, we do massage it afterwards. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about your peer comparisons, you can contact Sam. Um, he can give you the data for your peer libraries so you can see what they did answer for theirs as well and see what they said for all of these things. Um, these are the only nine criteria that use peer comparisons. Um, if you meet the average, or the median, um, which is a value lying in the middle when all the numbers are together, arranged in size order, you meet that, you earn those points. So it's a much more um, equitable way of you know, looking at what your library is doing, comparing you to libraries that are the same size as yours. All right, so now we're gonna go into the actual application form. So if you were at, I'm gonna close this, close this, 
preview there. So you are here. When, when you receive the email from me, you'll be able to click and go into the accreditation application form. You'll click off those 12 criteria that I just did. You will get here, put in your username and password, and then you'll go into your library's application form. This is the form for Beatrice Public Library um, that I'm just using as a demo. I am not going to actually submit it for them because I don't want to do that. But we're going to see um, how the form works. So at the top of the page here, we have a yellow box with some basic instructions. Um, it tells you here first uh, that there are certain indicators for the questions that we have um, imported the data from your public library survey that you have submitted. Green check, you meet the, grid, the guideline. Red X, you don't. And I'll scroll down here and you can see here's the green checks and the red Xs. These are not things that you can click on and change yourself. Um, so those are not ones that you can change. The other boxes are ones that you can click on whoops, and check yourself. Um, I will say, uh, as far as these um, go, if something has changed since you submitted your survey, and now you like, like for example, if this was a red X and you did not have a friends group, but since you submitted the survey because it was due back in February, you now have one, um, we can change this behind the scenes for you. So just let us know that actually we need, you know, we we have a friends group, we've set it up, can we? And we will go and we'll change that and you'll change, we can change the green, the red X to a green check so that you can earn those points. You can also see your peer libraries for all those peer questions that we mentioned. So here are the ones for Beatrice. You can see we only have one library that's similar in size to them, one community. So we did have to pull in um, data from Iowa libraries. So you can just see here in your form who are your peer libraries if you want to investigate them. If you want their actual public library survey data, contact Sam and he will send that to you for your peers. Um, we also tell you what the different levels are. There is that yellow question mark also throughout your application form like there was on that first uh, qualifications page, page that will give you some help for some questions you might need if you need any help with some questions. Uh, you'll see up here on the upper right, there is a total points box that kind of floats along as you scroll through the form. So as you check and uncheck things, you can see that it will change. Uh, so if I check this having a community response plan, that 77 went up to 87, uncheck it, goes back 87 down to 77. So as you go through here, you'll see how you're going, how, how many points you're earning. You can see um, where you are in, in the levels. Uh, for each qualification, we do have after that how many points it's worth. You can see how many you are going to earn as you check on each check each one of those. At the very bottom of the form, I'm going to quickly scroll down there. We do have a submit button and a save and resume later button. So if you get interrupted while you're in the middle of filling out this form, as does happen oftentimes in libraries, or if you realize I need to go check something or look up something before I can finish checking the boxes, save it. And when you come back, all the previous things you had already checked off will still be there. It will save those. And then um, you can continue until you're totally done and then submit the application. Um, if you don't come down here and hit the save button, the next time you come in, you'll have, we'll have to start all over checking off the boxes. So make sure if you need to jump off of it that you do that. You also see here your point total is at the very bottom of the page as well when you're done. So we're going to go up the top here. So the first section of your application form is governance and planning. Uh, by The first box gets checked for you because you checked off those 12 minimum qualifications on the first page. Uh, the next one is about having your community's response plan. Um, this is something that I um, used to say you had to have it approved, but that was wrong because I can't approve your plan until I look at also your application form. So I changed this so you just have submitted one to me. It does not have to be approved yet. We will look at them both together and then see if they get approved. Um, if you don't check that and try and check something else, you'll see a pop-up, a warning will come up saying that you have to have a community's response plan in order to be accredited. So it's prompting you to make sure you do that um, before you go any further. So I'm going to check that off. Uh, you can also earn points for reviewing the plan annually, which you really should be doing, uh, making sure that it is still valid, still useful for you. Then, uh, and you can tell us when you most recently looked at the plan. Next up is policies. Um, 
previously this used to say that you had a policy of this kind, but I kind of changed the wording to say that you have included these topics in are included in any of your policies. You might not have a policy that says it's a customer feedback policy, but you do have a way for live anyone to give you feedback. Um, there's a form they fill out, whatever it is. So you can just check off any each one of these you check, and I'm just randomly clicking. I don't know which ones Beatrice does or doesn't have, and um, you earn a point for each one of those that you have, whether you have a policy or it's mentioned in um, some policy. Um, oh, I should mention here about the community's response plan review. Uh, someone did ask about this previously. If you are doing uh, accreditation for the very first time, and this is your very first community's response plan, you cannot have reviewed it annually because you only it's your first time doing it. <laughs> so doing it doesn't count as reviewing it. That's creating it. This would be after you've had one for a number of years, and then you've looked at it and reviewed it. Um, some of these that we did add in here, we added uh, some uh, some policies that weren't there before. We added feedback, um, disaster planning, book challenges and, and considerations. That's something libraries are dealing with a lot now. I want to make sure you have one of those. Um, we also have here, um, if there's something we haven't listed here that you think is a really important policy that you have at your library, you can add it. You can add up to four additional ones and just let us know what it is. Next up is having a technology plan. A technology plan is something different than your community needs response plan or a strategic plan. It may be part of that. It doesn't have to be its own separate thing. This is how do you keep track of the technology in your library? How do you know when you need to update your computers? Um, and you need to have a plan for this, that every five years we are going to update. You know, we, have, we have a bank of 20 computers. and Every five years, five of them get updated so that we have a rotating um, and always have some, some new ones out there. Something like that that's an official plan for that. Um, and when you've most recently revised and looked at it, you can tell us that. Our next one's here. Do you have a friends group or a foundation? This is information that you give us in the supplemental survey that is in, in addition to the public library survey. These are automatically checked off for you. Part two is resources, uh, the resources to run your library, income, staff, facilities, et cetera. And this is where we get into our first peer comparisons. So you can he see here for local income, it gives the library's income, what the peer average is, and the peer median. And as long as you meet either one of those, you don't have to meet both, one or the other, um, you earn the points for that. So they got the local income. They're not open as many hours as their peers. Um, so they don't didn't earn that one. Uh, schedule of open hours reflects an attempt to meet the needs of the community. This just means, are you asking? It's always a good idea to see when do they think you should be open, when would they like you to be open. Um, it doesn't mean you have to change your hours to meet those uh, what they ask for. Uh, there may be um, things that you just can't do. We can't be open seven days a week, you know, eight hours a day. Uh, we can't be open every Saturday night, but at least you've asked the question. And then let us know when you did that. And does your library building meet all federal, state, and local codes for safety? I would hope every library does. We do have, as I mentioned, that help here. It pops up a new window and links you to things like accessibility, safety guidelines for you to refer to to see to make sure that you do <coughs> excuse me, um, meet those. Uh, <clears throat> the next session is staff. Uh, expenditures on staff equal to or greater than the average or median. So this would be um, salary, benefits, et cetera. And then this is where we have your library director certification. This has to be checked in order for you to be uh, accredited. Um, and it also reminds you here at what level your director must be certified. Um, we, in the help, it does, um, this help actually bumps you, pops you out to the librarian certification page. So you can quickly go there and see what you should be doing. Um, addition, and then here is where that additional library staff is that you did ask about. Um, if you, you have to, and, and for this library based on legal service area, they must have at least four staff that are also certified. They only have three of them, so they do do their certification, but they just they did not earn that. Um, okay. Uh, then we have number of library personnel that they have, also pre-filled from your, um, this is your peer, one of your peer comparisons, and then financial resources 
for um, education and training. So this is um, having a line item in your budget for to pay for any registration fees or any travel costs for your staff to be um, attend any training or professional development and giving them time off to do that. Um, if you have something like that, this is something you would enter in your public library survey. Uh, technology is the next section. Do you have an integrated library system? Uh, and is it online? Uh, do you have broadband internet access at speeds adequate to meet user needs in your library? This is something that is, of course, very subjective and is your opinion. Do you think it's the speed is fast enough or not? Uh, do you have people constantly complaining that they can't get to a page that's loading too slowly? Are you noticing on your own computer <coughs> that things are taking too long to load and you can't get to pages you need to quickly enough? Uh, in this case, you just need to be honest with us about what you think. Is it adequate or not? Um, and you'll notice many of these guidelines that you're checking off yourself and earning points. It is a, um, a trust thing. I'm trusting you to answer these questions um, uh, accurately and to not give false information on the form. So I am, you know, thanking you at your word. Um, doing this is on the honor system that, that you do think that your broadband speeds are adequate if you check that. Uh, do you have Wi-Fi in the library? That came from the Public Library Survey. Do you have a telephone service with an answering machine? Um, pretty basic. Technology accommodations for persons with disabilities. This would be things like a screen reader or adjustable desks, physical things that help anyone with disabilities use your library. And then another subjective question, an adequate number of computers for your library. And this would be something that you may mention in your community's response plan or in your technology plan, either one. For your collection, um, does it reflect the mission and goals of the library? I would hope so. Whatever your mission statement is and the goals, uh, this is something you will have mentioned in your community's response plan too. Um, how do you? How much weeding have you been done as you reported in your public library survey? Does the library staff use online websites to provide information? So going out on the internet and make running searches and finding information for them. Uh, what is your annual expenditure on materials as a percentage of your full operating expenditures? That's a peer comparison, annual circulation of items, peer comparison, turnover rate, and collection size. These are all being compared to um, your peer libraries. <clears throat> Next section is services. Um, what kind of services are you offering to your community? Do you have any outreach programs and services um, so this would be going for people who don't come to the library. So doing story time at the daycare center, uh, delivering books to homebound patrons or to the senior center, um, having a book um, bookmobile. Uh, do you do interlibrary loan for, do you borrow books through interlibrary loan for your customers? And then uh, some more peer comparisons that come from your survey data, um, attendance for program and programs. How does that compare to your peers? And then do you have specific programs that it's programs that target specific audiences? Like we have a teen program for this. We have a program for seniors that we go out and do. And then you'd list them here. This is something that would need to be mentioned in your plan. And this is where we talk. I talk about comparing your application form to your community's response plan. If you check this box and say you're doing these things, you should have something mentioned in your plan that matches up with what you've wrote in here. Like if you say you go to teens, seniors, whatever, that's got to be mentioned in your plan. And I'm going to compare that. Uh, do you use the databases that we offer through the Library Commission? This is Nebraska Access, so uh, free databases that any library can sign up for. You just got to, um, we pay for access to EBSCO host databases for any um, citizen of the state. So does your library use those? Um, if you look on our website for Nebraska Access, you can get a password and data uh, connected to that. Um, and then in addition to that, do you have any other databases that we don't supply that you are paying for yourself? Um, and here, Beatrice has Ancestry, Chilton, Mango, et cetera, et cetera. And they list this, this all came from the Public Library Survey. Uh, cooperation and collaboration. Um, this is working with um, other organizations in your community, um, trying to get out there and figure out what's going on and doing things with them and letting them know that the library board is there, um, that the library is there uh, to, to work with all sorts of organizations. 
So you see here, there's nothing here that gets pulled from your public library survey. This is all questions for you to answer and check off the boxes and earn the points for them. <clears throat> so does the library director or a board member attend at least two municipality, whatever you are, village, city, county, township, whatever your municipality is, at least two meetings a year? Um, this would be, could be, this could include that reporting, giving them your annual report. Um, but at any time, are you just attending just to report on what the library is doing or just be there so they know that the library exists and is, is a thing they should be paying attention to? Uh, does staff participate in community organizations to keep the library engaged and visible out there in the community? And here we have some help in the help guide. It does talk about what organizations are we referring to? Um, that would count for this. So this would be things like um, uh, Rotary, Kiwanis, um, any of those service organizations. Um, this is is in church groups, being in a book club, but those more community-based things. Uh, your board members may belong to these groups. They may have a membership, but this is specifically about, and, and that's okay, but that doesn't count for this guideline. This isn't wanting your library staff to be getting out there and participating. Uh, do you have a teen board, a teen library board? Um, TAB, they're sometimes called teen advisory board. Um, it's very, it's difficult in some libraries to get the teens to come in and use the library. Some of you do it great, but um, sometimes, you know, the young families, families bring in their young kids, do story time and all the time and do all that. Seniors and older adults definitely come back and use the library, but sometimes you lose that teen group. And many libraries have started having a teen advisory board where this whole separate group of teens that they say, you tell us what you want to do. You tell us what the teens are into <laughs> or what would be a good thing to, a good way to bring them into the library or something they would want to do. Uh, do you, does the library cooperate with other local entities for shared services? So this isn't just, um, it's going to their meetings, but actually having a program. So uh, working with the Parks and Rec Department to put in the uh, story walk in the park. So the library provides the books, the Parks and Rec provides the space, that's doing a shared service. Um, so this would be something that, as it says here in the help, they are identified as co-sponsors of the program. So people know that the library is doing something with this other organization. So this isn't, you know, the daycare comes in and use the library, that doesn't count. They're just using the library's regular services. It's some sort of special extra program that is being done. And then you would list who you're working with. Uh, do your board members or staff participate in advocacy efforts? This could be something local or national. Uh, the American Library Association or every library both have events and programming about that. Um, Nebraska Library Association has their Nebraska Library Association has their annual advocacy day, usually in March, uh, do, where you come to Lincoln and talk to your the legislatures of, about um, libraries. So you can have up to five people, either board or staff members, do that. And then, do you have? Are you in any resource sharing groups? Any group purchases that you do? Um, Overdrive. These are just some examples. The Overdrive group for for ebooks, uh, Nebraska card for sharing for a library card to use other libraries. The Pioneer Consortium. So are you in any sort of uh, group sharing like that? And the last section is on communications. Uh, how do you uh, spread the word about what the library is doing? So do you have on your website your mission statement, vision statement, whatever it is, and your policies listed so everyone knows what they are and can access them? Do you provide, do you, and in this, this is this here, and uh, the next one about providing public directions on website, basically using any sort of social media. These are things I'm going to go check. I'm going to go look for your library's website, and I'm going to see can I find your mission statement, and I can find your policies on it. Um, if I can't, I'm going to reach out to you and ask, okay, am I at the wrong website? Maybe do you have a new site that I'm not aware of? Is there somewhere else you're posting these things? Let me know where to find this information so that I can confirm that you were supposed to have that, that it was okay for you to check off that item. Uh, same thing with having any sort of social media, um, a website, blog, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, or whatever the newest one they come up with is. Uh, do you have those? Do you po post to them at least monthly? 
I will check and see, did you do something within the last month? These are kind of places that have to be constantly, up, regularly updated. Sorry, I won't say constantly, but regularly updated. Social media is not static. Um, so look, and I will look and see if you are doing that. So if you list here, we have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter, um, we have a blog, and I go and look, and you don't have one, or you haven't posted something in like six months or a year, I'm gonna ask you about it. Uh, do you use other things that are not internet? Uh, internet's great, social media is great, but there are other ways you need to be marketing as well still. Uh, radio ads, something in the newspaper, flyers, a poster in the, in the window of the beauty shop, whatever. Um, anything that you do that's not social media, that's more analog, we'll call it. Uh, do you have any updated exhibits and displays? So uh, new book display, uh, Women's History Month, uh, have someone who has a teacup collection come in and put it in a case and show and talk about that. Do you have any sort of those kind of interactive displays? Do you have a bulletin board that the public can use? So not just some place where you post the things that are going on in the library, but something where you invite the public to come in and use the library as a community space to share information. So uh, someone, uh, a teenager could put up babysitting services, law, or someone could say lost dog, whatever, anything that they want, you want to let the public use. Uh, do you report um, on the library, usually usually monthly, but it can be whenever you happen to be on their agenda, but more regularly to your municipality, village, city, council, whatever, county. So this is separate from that annual report that you're supposed to, you are required to do in February. This is just other regular reports and letting actually reporting and saying, here's what's happening in the library in the last month or two or whatever. Do those reports go on your website somewhere? So do post those. And then do you communicate some way with business leaders and civic organizations? Same kind of thing as going and um, being on the agenda item for your municipality, being on the agenda item for the Chamber of Commerce meeting or the local business group or the Rotary Club or something. Regularly, you know, some going to some group and talking about the library or, you know, speaking about how the library can work with them or just updating them on things. Um, and that's the bottom of the form. It automatically fills in the library director's info and you've got your point total here and at the side. So uh, with all my random clicking, they got 240 points. That gets them to silver, yay. <laughs> um, at this point, you could submit the application and I will get that and that's fine. Or you can save and resume later if there's still some things you want to change or update on here. Um, All right, so that is the application form. Any questions about any of the items, any of the guidelines on here? What did I not mention that you were wondering about? Is, the guideline, is there a guideline that you're confused about and don't understand what it is referring to? No. All right. So that is the application form. And now we will go and look at community, your community needs response plan. Um, as I said, both the application form and the plan both need to be submitted to me. They do not need to be submitted at the same time. Uh, if you do your application, if you submit your plan to me and then you do your application later, that's fine. You do it the other way around as well, that's fine. Uh, do remember you've got that first item in the application form that you do have to check off saying you submitted your plan. So um, you can do your plan first to me and then later on um, do the application form. Uh, the plan, uh, if you are working on it and you want me to look at a draft, I can do that and review it. Um, so we can have a lot of back and forth on working on your community's response plan before you submit the final version of it. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, our, our regional library system directors are great also at giving you advice and working on your plans with you. So you're welcome to reach out to them about that or also about any of your um, accreditation and application form requirements. So I'm gonna to go to the community needs response planning page now. We have a whole separate page all about community needs response planning because there's, um, there's a lot to go into this. 
Um, but I don't want you to be scared off <laughs> or um, uh, think that this is something you cannot do. Um, lots and lots of libraries have done that. As I said, we've got 200 and some odd libraries in the state and 183 have gone through this process and are um, uh, accredited. Uh, you may have a previous plan, as I mentioned. It may be called a strategic plan if it's if it's older. Um, so if you have a previous plan, you do not need to start from scratch and write a new one. You can take your previous one and just update the parts of it that are old. Um, old things would be any demographics you're reporting in your community profile, telling me you know census data, um, projects and and programs you may be working on. A description of what your community is like, what, what's going on in your community, what people need, those kind of things you'd want to be updating. But you do not have to start from scratch if you already have one. Pull out your old one and just update it. Uh, if you can't find your old plan, if you don't know where it is, uh, you misplaced it or you're a new director since the last time it was done and you don't know what the old director did with it, uh, reach out to me. I should have a copy of everyone's plan here and I can get that to you that you can then work off of. All right, so the whole purpose of the Community Needs Response Plan is looking outside of the library at your community, seeing what their needs are and responding to them, um, serving the unique needs in your community. So uh, I believe that the reason for having this as being a requirement to be accredited is that we, the concern that some in some communities this is not being done. Uh, you know, we know what we need to do as a library. We do the basic services. We know what libraries are supposed to be for, here for, and we do all of that. But there may be things you're not aware of that are going on. So you need to look outside the library walls, outside the normal library thing that is done, things that you do, and find out what's going on and seeing if there's some of those things that you can do something about. Um, there's gonna be lots of needs in your community that the library can't do a thing about, and you're not responsible for them, and that's totally fine. Uh, but you will come up with things that you can do. Um, and this is going to be some doing this process is going to is going to come up with things the kind of things you didn't learn in library school or in basic skills classes thinking um outside the box uh, so something non-traditional something that the live the community needs um, some examples of some things that libraries have done is uh, uh loaning out um, radon detectors in their community because that was something that might be going on that is an issue or a concern City offices may, be offered, may offer this, but they're only open like nine to five. And if somebody works nine to five, how do they get one of these? Libraries can be op potentially open in the evenings, weekends, have the library be a distribution point. Um, another community I know did um, like rat traps, uh, mouse traps, those kind of things. There was a lot of, li the city was doing a, a push to help clean up the vermin in town. And so they were offering this as a, um, uh, for free, but only open certain hours. So the library became a place where those kind of things could be handed out, it's things like that. Uh, possibly holding meetings, even just being the space. The Many people think of the library as a nice neutral space, a safe space. And you need to have a community discussion about something in town. Instead of going to the, the town halls meetings, the, the library can be, we're going to have a focus group. We're going to just have a meeting uh, to talk about the need for a dog park. People are just taking their dogs anywhere and everywhere, and it's just become chaos. Or we need a splash pad. We need something for the kids to do in the summer. They are, they are running wild. <laughs> Things like that. And you can be the space that you, you, know, you can't help put in a dog park or a splash pad, but you can host the community meeting and be that community space for them. So these are the kind of things we're talking about, thinking outside of traditional library um, services. So your plan must be up to date, meaning written or updated within the last five years. So if you have something and your plans, um, the, the your plan needs to cover a certain number of years. So it will say this plan covers you know, 2022 to um, 2027, five years. And so that covers the time period we're in now. You can just say, hey, here's the plan I did before. It's still good. I don't need to do a new one. And that's fine. And that's, especially now that I changed around everybody's expiration dates, uh, people's plans are not going to match up even if they used to before. Uh, so look at what you have. If it extends already covering the date we're in, 
just send me that and say, hey, we have one and it covers these years. You're good. You don't have to do anything new. But if it doesn't, if it's something old that became expired, then you would need to do a new one. Okay, there are seven basic elements, seven parts that need to be in your plan. And we're gonna go into a detail about all of these. I just wanna briefly show you what's here on the community needs response planning page that you can use to help you uh, write these, write your plan or update yours. So we'll pop back up to this in a second. Uh, we have some webinars that you can also watch other ones that we have done or have, have provided that can be of uh, useful. Uh, census data for finding demographics about your community. After the last census was done in 2020, in 2021, we had census staff come and do, uh, census bureau staff come and do a webinar for us. Uh, community engagement, working out in your community, the good presentation we did about that. And then two things here that do stay strategic planning in their title, yes, and I did say we changed the name of ours from strategic plan to community needs response plan, but the process for doing strategic planning, some of the, some of that work can definitely be helpful for you. So watch those if you'd like to. We also have examples of other libraries' plans here in Nebraska. So uh, these are ones that I've pulled out that are really good examples, um, good plans. So feel free to look at these. Please do use them as a template if you need to do a new one or if you just don't like the one how yours looks now. Use it as a basis, as a template for yours in the same format, but just make sure you update it, change it to your library's info. Uh, there is no requirement on the length of a plan. Uh, you'll notice some of these plans are three pages long. Some of them are 20, 30 pages long. It just depends on uh, what is you need to include in yours, how detailed it needs to be, um, what information you're providing. As long as these seven elements are in there somewhere, you're good. There's no minimum length. Um, as I mentioned, we did make changes to part of the plan, eliminating that SWOT analysis as of last year. So we do have plans here that are pre-2022, so they have that SWOT analysis still in them. And then I've got some new ones from last year that were good ones that were submitted that I've got here as examples too. Uh, so you'll note that that'll be a difference between the pre-2022 and the new ones. They do not have SWOT. They have a different way of analyzing. It's okay if you like to do SWOT and you want to. It's it's not required that you don't, you know, if you do a SWOT, I'm not gonna say, oh, that's bad. You still, we're still talking about strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats going on, but we're talking about it in a slightly um, more open <laughs> way. So look at any of these examples. And then we have a lot of resources and guides here. Worksheets you can fill out, how-to guides to help you work through each part of the plan um, until you can come up with an actual community's response plan uh, that you that you like, that works for you, um, and that is acceptable to me. Uh, okay. So let's go into the seven required elements. Uh, the first thing is the library's mission statement. This is something hopefully you should have. Um, it's just your, it's a one liner, or a small paragraph about why does our library exist? What are we here for? Um, it's something you should review every now and then. It's, um, make sure it's still valid and is actually, uh, reflects what you're still doing in the library. There may be sometimes some new things you would want to add to it and, and mention that weren't in there before. You might wanna tweak the wording. Um, or something. Uh, we do have a how-to guide here about mission statement down here on that first section. And there we go, move this over. And, um, oh, yes, okay. And we have some examples. Uh, New York Public Library, it's just one sentence. Mission of the New York Public Library is to inspire lifelong learning, advance knowledge, and strengthen our communities. Very nice and, and very concise. Uh, but some are longer. Here's some from some other libraries. Um, do some research if you want to see what other loans have said. Uh, but just something short that's your main reason for being for your library. Then you need to do a community have a, a community profile in your plan. This is demographics. This is the statistics. What makes your community unique? 
um, demographics from census data, and I'm going to show you how to get into that and look up those actual numbers. Demographics from anything that may be available from your community, uh, from your municipality, if they have anything like that. Um, this is where you also write up more of a paragraphs about how our community was founded in so-and-so year, and we have this many um, businesses, and this is the school district, and how many kids are in it, and these can be a business, these places offer internet, and there is this kind of recreation, and these businesses in town, this new factory in town, this one's left, that kind of just, a, you know, the, give me a picture of what your community is like. Um, and I'll, sh like I said, I'll show you the details of how you can get some of that data um, when we get down to our help guides. Uh, the third element is an assessment of the community's needs. So this is not uh, the library's needs or what the community needs from the library. This is what the community needs. And sometimes this is hard to get your head around that as you're, you're coming from the library's point of view because you're looking at this for to find out what does my community, what's going on in my community and what can the library do about it. And that's ultimately what you're working towards. But when you do this assessment, you're just saying no library, not thinking about that, what's going on in the community? What is, what bad things are happening? What good things are happening? And doing some research on that. Um, and like I said, a lot of these things are gonna be nothing you at the Liza Library can do anything about, and that's perfectly fine. Um, you're just gonna find, get a, you're gonna get this big list of here's all the things people are saying that we need to do, um, and that's a problem, and you're going to prioritize those, see what's, what people are most concerned about, and then see if any of those, and see if any of those are things you can do. So kind of narrowing it down. Here's all the things wrong happening that people think we should do. Um, here's the most ones they mention most, and then here are the two or three that actually, hey, library can help out with that. Uh, the fourth criteria is that, and this is the change where we switch from the SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, to an analyzing the library's strengths and resources, barriers to completing anything, and opportunities for improvement. So we made it a little more, a little broader. This is something that was very, this is the hardest part, I think, for libraries in doing their community's response plan. The most difficult thing that they struggled with um, the most. And what we had, when the, the previous criteria was the strengths and weaknesses were about the library, what are the library's strengths, what are the library's weaknesses. And then what are the opportunities and threats from outside the library? So for the opportunities and threat opportunities and threats, you cannot mention the library at all. You're just looking outside the building and trying to figure out what's going on out there that are opportunities and threats in our community. And that's not always how it works. Things are not that cut and dry and hard-lined, and a lot of people had trouble not mentioning the library when they talked about these opportunities and threats. It kept getting tossed in there. And so we realized when we did this um, evaluation of the program last year, why does it have to be that way? Why does it have to be so cut and dry? It's They're so intertwined, and that's the whole point. You are involved in the community. So we made it a little um, looser. So you're talking about the library's strengths and resources, any barriers and any opportunities for improvement, and not just related to the library, but also related to the community. Um, and I'll, we've got some nice guides that will help you narrow down that as well. Uh, once you have all this data, your demographic data, um, assessment of what the needs are of the community, what are the library is good at, any barriers they're having, then you're gonna take all that and think about it and analyze what's going on, what this means. What are the most important things going on and is there anything the library can do based on all this data that I have, that we have come up with? Did we notice in the census data that there is a huge increase in young families in the community since the last time we looked at the census data? That's something we should try and focus on, some new programming for that. Um, is there a need for a discussion about having a splash pad or a dog park in the community? Let's reach out to Parks and Rec and talk about um, hosting a meeting. You know, we have the space, we have the meeting room, let's work with them on that. Those are the kind of things that could come up. And what you're gonna do is come up with some specific goals, things you're going to specifically do that you came up with based on all this data that you gathered and when you analyzed it. Now, uh, 
as the library, you're going to do lots of things. You do lots of things, lots of programming, lots of uh, resources you offer, lots of things you do. Um, for this plan, we want you to come up with two to three specific things that you're going to tell us about that you're going to do based on all this data you gathered. Basically, you're showing me that you've done this research, you've looked at it, you've thought about it, and you realized, hey, you came up with some new ideas about what you could do with it. Um, these could be continuing with current goal, current things you're doing, but expanding them. Um, they could be something brand new. They could be modifying something you're already doing. It could, it, it, there's no real rules, <laughs> rules about it. Just you're going to tell me about three specific things that you are going to try and do based on this data that you gathered. Um, like I said, your library is going to do lots of things. Just tell me about three of them and make sure that it is because you gathered this specific data. And then the last thing is a plan for evaluating your plan. <laughs> uh, so you are going to, this community response plan, it's supposed to be a living document, something that you refer to regularly, a guide for you. It is not something that you do now, then you put it on a shelf and you come back to it in five years because you're up for reaccreditation again. You're coming up with these goals, and these programs, this is going to be the start of things you're going to have to do. So it's something you're going to have to look at and go back to and say, and at least once a year minimum, you know, once you come up with these goals, you may, you'll then get into the nitty gritty and specifics about, okay, now how we're going to pull this off, let's go off and do that. But you'll go back at, and at least once a year, you should, and say, okay, we said we were going to do this. Did we do it? And if so, great. If not, why? What went wrong? What, what, what do we need to do to try and make it happen? Um, and so you're going to have an evaluate a plan that explains how often you're going to go back, who's going to evaluate it, what's going to happen when you do that evaluation. So those are the seven required parts that need to be in your plan in some way. And you will see them in all of these examples. So now I'm going to pop down here. So you have any questions about any of those elements before I get into the details of how you can get all of this? With our help guides. Step into your questions section. <clears throat> okay. Whenever you think of anything, if I say something that's confusing to you or something you want to know more about, just go ahead and type it in there, please. I want to answer all your questions that you might have. Okay, so we have, uh, as I said, worksheets and help guides and resources here that can help you do each part of this. And the first thing we have right up here is we have a 12-step 12, 12 program that can help you um, go through this process. Um, now, this is uh, just one way to get there. Uh, you do not have to use this, but if you're just wondering, I don't even, you, I have no clue where to start. Um, it's not the only way to get to and ultimately having a plan, but it is something that you can use as a guide. As you see, we just kind of broke it up into individual steps, um, establish a planning team, complete um, a community profile using census data, gather information community using focus groups. And you can see then these refer to different worksheets and guides that we've put together that are related to each of those steps. So this can help you kind of break it down into small bits and make it easier to come up with your plan. So you're not so overwhelmed by, I have to do all these things. Just break it up into small parts. Um, so this is if you want to use this to guide you through. Um, and if you have no clue where to start, you can do that. Um, or you don't have to use it if you're fine just kind of jumping in and doing it yourself. So the first thing you need to do is uh, bring together a planning team. Who is going to work on this? Now, do not do this alone as a library director. Uh, that is, is not necessary and it is just is going to make it more difficult for you. Um, you want a group of people to help you do this plan or update this plan if you have a previous one. Um, we did have an issue a few years ago where the previous director at a library had done this all on their own. They had written the, they had done the research, come up with a plan, written it up, and submitted it to me. And no one else in the library was involved, and nobody knew how they came up with this, how they came up 
with these goals. Nobody even heard about these things. And when they, then the director was had left, they had gone on to another job. And the rest of the staff was then when they were up for reaccreditation, they were left floundering and wondering, we don't even know how they came up with all of this. What do we do? You want other people involved and you don't have to take it on yourself. You don't take all of this on your shoulders on your own. You shouldn't have to. You, you'll you need, you want help with this. Uh, so you could have um, a library staff member, someone who, you know, ask your staff who'd like to be involved in this project um, and, and help us with doing this. Um, a library board member, bring in one of the board members who might be really interested in making this happen. Uh, people from the community, um, person, someone who is really involved in what's going on in the community, they maybe will do a lot of volunteering with the library. They may donate funding, um, you know, bring in someone from the outside because this is talking about what we're doing for the community. Bring in a community member. Um, you don't want too many people and you don't want too few people. Uh, now, of course, depending on your size of your community, you may not have the resources to have a lot of people, but um, it says here five to 12, depending on the size of who you have available and um, who is interested in participating and, and what you need to do. Um, and you will have to um, work with making sure these people will work well together. So that may be something for you <clears throat> as a library director to focus on is who do I know that will work well together or bring some good ideas to this. Uh, but there's still maybe some conflicts and things you need to, you know, maybe, you know, people come to a consensus about what we are doing and why we're doing it and what the answers are going to be on this um, plan that we put together. Uh, we have a, um, we have some other resources here about project management and why you do planning uh, that you can look at. But we also have this plan to plan <laughs> worksheet. I'm gonna open this up a little so you can see the whole thing. Um, another thing, just like that 12 steps that can, that um, that we put together that I showed you, uh, that can help you keep track of what you need to do. Um, what are you gonna do? Who's gonna do it? Uh, and when they're gonna start? target date to finish, when you actually finished, and if anything needed to be reviewed about it. So uh, everyone doesn't have to do every part of this plan. You can assign someone to just look up census data. So census numbers, demographics assigned to a board member. Uh, running a focus group of the community assigned to a staff member. Whatever different things you're doing, um, you can, this is just a sheet that you can use, print this out, and use it to help keep track of things. Your target dates and finish dates, it's okay if things don't meet, you don't meet the deadlines. This is just for your own, you know, general reference of we need to have this done. Well, of course, minimum by October 1st, but uh, let's have it done within a month. Figure out the demographics. Okay, get me the census data so we can work on that. So just putting it all in writing here and having a way to help help you keep track of it. So this is a worksheet you could use to do that if you want to. So your community profile is the next thing that you're going to gather, and this is the, the data, the numbers. Uh, obviously, uh, census information is going to be your prime resource for this, census data, U.S. census data. We just recently had the decennial census, census done in 2020, so that's great. We have really current, up-to-date census information. Uh, so you can go ahead and just go right to your census data for your community and use that. Uh, but if you want, you know, that was done in 2020. If you do want to um, find something more recent than that, the census does do what they call their American Community Survey in between censuses. Censuses. <laughs> so if you, and they do this in five year blocks, and I'm gonna open this up over here. And it's working on it slowly. All right. So if you want something um, where they've gathered data in between censuses, if in between the, the big census, you can go here and use the American Community Survey data tables. And you can see they've got economic housing, um, comparison of estimates over time. So you can see how things have, you know, the trends over time. So you can look at this as well if you want to. Um, the, oops, let's get out of this. The reason for going and find the actual data is you may have an idea of what's going on in your community or a board member or people in the community may say, oh, we know there's no young people here. We never see them. Um, there's no um, uh, 
mean, no minority population of any sort in our town. I haven't seen any around in my neighborhood. Um, or we we have tons of them. Oh my gosh, there's so many seniors in town. There's so many old people. Everyone is aging. You know, the the baby boomers. Everyone's getting old. Uh, with this data going to the census, you can have the numbers to back up those assumptions. Uh, verify what people claim are happening in town. Um, and this is something you have to back it up when you do say, actually, we found out that there are not a huge number of old people. There's young families. And here's the census numbers to prove that. And that's why we're doing a story time in the daycare centers. That could be your thought process. So this is where you can find um, all that data. This is why you want to find those numbers. Uh, we have a worksheet here that you can use. And this is just a blank one where um, you can fill in the, you see all this, all this information from the American Community Survey or from the census data, wherever you get these numbers. You can print this out and this is all the type of numbers you could get. You don't have to get it all if you don't want to or can't find it, but this is just giving you a list of these are the kind of, the kind of information and numbers you can find from the Census Bureau. Um, education level, uh, language spoken, family economics, community economics. Uh, the last part here, cultural characteristics, this community, this is something, as you can see, there's not numbers, but you would have to come up with uh, cultural and recreational activities that are popular in your community. Just write them down. Right, so. so this is a blank one that you can use to fill in your library's data. We also provide you with statewide figures. Sam pulled this together for me. And this is from the most recent uh, public library survey data and American Community Survey. He went out and did this this year. So if you want to compare your community to the state as a whole to see, you know, compared to the state, our community is this. Um, this is the um, statewide numbers for all of the, the, the numbers that are in here. Of course, the things like uh, cultural and recreational activities, that's not something that we can provide for you. But all the numbers are here for the statewide data based on the most recent uh, census information that we have. So I'm going to show you the census website here. Uh, a few years ago, they came up with a new page where they redesigned how we access all census data. A little bit to load up here. Here we go. Uh, it's data.census.gov is the URL, and um, this is where you can access anything they have uh, gathered from the census. There are tables, uh, maps that you can put together, um, graphs, bar graphs, all sorts of things in here. Uh, there's so much to dig into. Uh, they also have training resources, FAQs, quick start guides, uh, videos to show you how to use and na navigate through um, the system. There's that webinar we did here in Nebraska too. Go ahead and watch that if you want to learn more. Um, if you really want to learn more about getting into the census information. But I'm going to go up to the top here and you start just right here in their general search um, form. And I'm going to use Beatrice since we were looking at, whoops, at their uh, credit application form. And you see here, I just typed in Beatrice, that was it. And there's multiple ones. There's one in Nebraska, Alabama and Nebraska. Uh, depending on your city, just typing in the name like that may come up with the one in Nebraska, but you might have to add in city or town or whatever, uh, or village to have it come up with the Nebraska one. So just play around until you find yours that pops up. And then you just click on it here to bring up your community's info. There we go. And uh, this brings up, starts with a whole list of tables that you can um, go and look at. Race, demographic and housing estimates, age and sex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, maps that you can look at for those same things. And then pages that are specific to Beatrice that you can dig down into. So all these different maps and tables you can look at. Over here on the right, which I really like that they do um, down here is related searches, where they have, I'm gonna try and, let's see, yeah. That's much easier to read, isn't it? Uh, I don't know why it's so small on this page, but uh, they have these related searches 
where they, for you, will look, will dig down into the different categories, Beatrice, city, um, business and economy, education, employment, um, health, et cetera. So if you're looking for Nebraska, Beatrice, income and poverty, if you click on that, it'll take a few minutes here to run through and pull up. And this one is bringing up maps, income in the past 12 months, median, median, mean, median, poverty status, earnings, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see in the last 12 months, this is using uh, American community uh, data. Um, so you can click on any of those, let's go back up here, to get into those, those specific subsets if you want to look at those. Uh, what I also really like is this profile that they have here. For every community, there is this, where you can see it's the general data, total population, median household income, housing units, et cetera, has, um, um, here. If you click on that, it goes into the profile specific to your community. And so you've got some of the general numbers here, um, employment, families and living arrangements, race, housing, health, et cetera. Uh, you've got bar graphs of things, comparing maps, all these different you know, ones that are specific to your town. So this is really, I think, the easiest place to find a lot of these numbers that you may be looking for. And you see it tells you where these numbers are each from. This is from the 2020 census. This is from the 2021 American Community Survey, five-year estimates. So data done since the census. Um, so, highly recommend looking at this uh, profile. Um, our search bar is now up here at the top as well, um, so we can do other searches if you want to. Now, your community, your library may serve patrons and people just from your city, but also from nearby cities possibly, nearby communities. If they don't have a library, they may come to yours. Um, you may serve the county as a whole. You may be the county library. Um, officially or unofficially. So you may want to look up um, other communities' data too. So if you know that a lot of people from the next door town, the town over, come to your library, look up theirs and find their information and so that you have that data as well. You want to know who are your users and what their numbers are, not just, well, we are the city of Beatrice, so I'm just looking at Beatrice numbers. That's not who's coming into your library. Um, you can also look up your county. So here, um, Gage County, Nebraska, I can do that. So if I'm the county library and I get the same kind of thing um, as, uh, yeah. there we go. It takes some time to run the search and bring up. There's so much data in here. It's the only, I'm assuming it's the only page that's really slow like this. There we go. Now we have the Gage County information. So their population, all the tables and things for Gage County, those same related searches, but for the county, and then a profile for the county. So if you know that people from the whole county are coming in, look at those numbers too. And all of this data is what you are gonna report to me. Um, whatever you've decided to, to, that is important in your community, that's what you are going to put into your community's response plan that you um, submit to me. Any questions about census data? I can answer some things. I know the basics. <laughs> I highly recommend watching their thing, their resources, training, or the webinar that we did previously with the Census Bureau staff. All right. The next big part of your plan will be assessing the community needs, um, gathering information about what's going on in your community and uh, what people are thinking about. Uh, we have a worksheet that you can use. Yeah, we have a worksheet here of the different kind of things that you could do. Um, you don't have to do all of these things. These are just a whole bunch of ideas, um, examples of what you can do. The goal is what's important. The goal is to uh, find out what's happening in your community. Now, um, if something like this has already been done, don't do it again. Don't do it reinvent the wheel. Many communities have themselves done a community needs survey 
or um, a you know some sort of study and, and asking the community, hey, what do you want from your city? Uh, if you've if anything like that has been done, I would say within the last five years, just use it. You do not have to go through any of this work if someone else has already done it. Um, if your community or your county or somebody has done this about your your area, just use something that's already been put together and look at that report and use that to and analyze and decide what you're going to do and find out what's going on in your community. So don't re, don't redo something that's already been done. Um, but if it has not been done, these are ways that you can gather this information. Um, and one of the things that is hard sometimes for people, so you could bring together focus groups, do interviews with people, do surveys, um, and I'll talk about some of the details of these. But um, some people who come to these focus groups or who you talk to are possibly going to be confused about what you're asking for. They see the library is asking me these questions. They want to know what I think about the library. But that's not what you're trying to find out here. You're trying to find out what is happening in the community. Um, the discussions are supposed to be about the community, not the library. You happen to be the library hosting these discussions or asking the questions. Uh, so I recommend starting off with a few library questions, maybe, uh, just to get it out of their system. <laughs> uh, let them get that done, and then, and then you know, move into questions about the community. And we have here some sample community questions that is what are the kind of things we're talking about. Um, how satisfied are you with living here? What do you like most, least? Would you recommend someone else live here? What's the most critical issue facing the community? All of these kind of questions are the kind of general questions is what you're really wanting them to talk about. So let them talk about the library for a little bit, but then steer the conversation to these questions. Um, So you can hold a focus group. This would be basically just a open call for anyone to come in and we're having a meeting to talk about the community and what's going on. Uh, you can specifically invite certain people to the focus group if you want it to be more smaller or more focused. <laughs> um, there's some things you do have to pay attention to with running a focus group. We do have um, tips about running a focus group here that will um, be helpful for you. Uh, some things that might come up as you know, you know the people in your community. You may know someone who will monopolize the conversation, just talk over everyone else. Yeah, certain people may be quieter. You want to, you need someone who can facilitate this, who can work with those kind of issues. You know, make sure the people not speaking get their chance to talk. Um, so someone who can negotiate that kind of thing. Uh, bribing with food is highly recommended. They were, we will all be offering coffee and donuts to everyone, anyone who comes to the library this morning to talk about the what's going on in our community, uh, that kind of thing. Um, if you don't want to do a general open um, focus group, you could do a, what we call it, a key informant interview. So specifically talking to a particular person or a particular group. Um, it may be better than a focus group or a survey because you can get really one-on-one -on -one and personal with people. So a smaller group, um, superintendent of the school, parents who are big users of the library, um, church leaders, anyone who, you know, think um, has an in on what's going on or has, has, has a real stake in the community and cares a lot about it. Um, you can pick who's going to be in the group. It does not have to be open to anyone and everyone in this case. And you want to ask them something more direct than just the general focus group questions like, what does your group need? What does the school need? What does the church need? What does the parent group need? Um, get them to really focus specifically on, on them. So you can get a little more in-depth and you know, personal and, and really dive into that. Uh, you can also just do a survey, survey monkey, something like that, online, in paper. Uh, this could be something anonymous. Maybe some people are uh, feel better giving anonymous questions, not sitting in a room with a bunch of other people. Um, put it in, um, work with the Chamber of Commerce or a local utility company to put it in the bills. See, here's the survey, or here's just a small flyer that says, go to this link and answer the city's the, the library survey about the community. Um, church newsletter, school newsletter, post the flyers else out and about. 
Um, and then just walking around, your own observations are perfectly acceptable in a good way. <laughs> you know, you know, you can just see what's going on and just write it down. Note when you see people, you know, when you're having conversations with people, or you hear people talking, or you see things going on. Um, and then you're gonna, um, and just, you know, keep track of that in, in some way, you or your staff. And then on the second page of this, Take all this information and try and prioritize it. How one things that are uh, um, mentioned most frequently down the list, however long it ends up being, the ones that are mentioned least frequently. So the the top 10 to 15 most commonly mentioned things, either that are bad happening, good happening, um, what they think about what's going on in uh, the community. So that can help you um, narrow down what you're going to do with all these about these needs um, we also have some a uh, key informant interview example here so um when you're getting into those personal questions some specific things that you can ask what are the problems facing our community regarding employment what has happened that makes you think um and these are these are in this is an example of doing that interview with the actual question and answers that could be um that you could receive so some more examples of questions that you can use in the sample questions and interview example. So you've got your demographics, you've got what's happening in your community. Now you're gonna take stock. This is what used to be the SWAT, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we are changing it to, we have changed it to analysis of the library's strengths and resources and analysis of barriers and opportunities for improvement. And we have a worksheet here to help you do that. And you'll see a lot of the starting off here is things having to do with the library, but then on the second page, it gets into things just in the community itself. So strengths and resources in the community, barriers in the community, opportunities for improvement. Um, so from the community, Point of view and from the library point of view all of these things um, now you're not going to fill in every one of these boxes this is just a nice sheet that you can print out and use to, as a guide um, and it can be brainstorming um, just do a brainstorming meeting with your staff or your board or give this to your staff or your board members for themselves to fill it in same kind of thing they can submit it anonymously if that's helpful um, and then you can refine it a little later and see what is everybody talking the most about similar to the community needs um, you want to take what you know about the library in your community and fit it into a, one of these boxes though like we know that our volunteers are great they are a real strength and we're doing great with them or they are we have them but we don't know what to do with them that's an opportunity for improvement they keep volunteering and we just don't know what to use them for that's something we can work on um, is the technology in the library the computers the internet service is that good um, do we have the resources for it? Is there a barrier? Do we not have the money or do we not have the space for a maker space? We don't have a separate room to put all this in. Um, those kind of things. Funding, do we have enough funding? Should we, um, opportunities for improvement? Should we apply for more grants? Is that something we can work on? Um, these are just ideas. Uh, something that is um, for economy, is there a new employer coming into town or an employer leaving? Um, is the plant, is a factory shutting down? Is a new, is a new business coming to town? And both of those ways, sides, um, as a library, you could do resume writing classes or resources. Um, what's the social climate? Is are are there teens running wild, and we need to do something about that? Um, in community relations, are there new um, new ethnic groups coming in and and working in our community now that weren't here before? And how are we work relating to them? And how are we reaching out to them? Just thinking about all these different things. Uh, sometimes it is really hard to pat yourself on the back. We all have trouble saying good things about ourselves and bragging, but do it. If there's something you think is really good, write it down. But also be honest with yourself. We have these volunteers and we've struggled with um, using them. So that's an opportunity for improvement. Think about things you could do. Why is there a barrier to getting volunteers if you don't have any and you wanted them? Things like that. Um, we have a guide here about stake, taking stock too that can help you think this through. Sometimes it's writing up phrases, sometimes it's getting uh, data and numbers. Um, so use some of these resources as you're going through that. Oh, I already did that. 
So then once you have all this data, the community profile, the demographics, um, you've figured out what needs are happening out in your community, you've taken stock of your library and community and what you, you might have to offer um, or what you need to work on, then you're gonna develop those specific goals. Um, those three things, um, like you have three, two is okay. Minimum two, so two to three specific things you're gonna do based on all this data you've gathered. And like I said, you're gonna have lots of things the library does. This is not every single program, every single thing, but just three things you've come up with based on this information you've gathered. So you found out there's actually lots of young families according to the census data that are coming into the community. So there have popped up, there have been like, there's now like five daycare centers in town suddenly they need, um, what, what can we do with these daycare centers? Well, we have a great team of people or a great um, children's librarian that does story time. Let's do a story time in the, um, at the daycare centers, go out to them to show them what the library can do for them. And then they might start coming to the library afterwards. So that would be your goal to create a story time program in the lab, in that, in the daycare. Yeah, story time in the daycare centers. Um, now, to figure out what you're going to do, we have information about setting priorities for that, but I want to talk about writing SMART goals. This is something some of you may have heard of before. Whoops, scrolling too far. It's an acronym. Then this is a document that came from a university, so it mentions university, but anyone can use this as, as a guide. Um, in order, when you're writing goals, you need to really focus and set priorities, but then this can help you do all the different parts of a goal is something that's actually you can use and 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 viable and actually useful to you. Um, SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time framed. So your goals should meet all five of these criteria. So um, specific, what specifically are you doing? What has to be done? We need to. We want to. We have tons of daycares. We want to do story time in the daycares. Great. Um, you need to be able to measure it. How many story times, how many children were there, how often did we do it? Those are things you can measure, ob obviously. Attainable, something you can actually achieve. You got five daycares in town. I would not start off with saying we're going to have story time in every single daycare in town. That's a lot and your, your, your employees may revolt. <laughs> <laughs> so say we're going to start and do a pilot project with one daycare and see how it goes. And then we could possibly later expand it to other ones. Um, relevant to what's, what you do as a library, ideally with all that information you gathered, that should fall out that it is relevant. That's why you have all that data backing up. And then time frames. You've got to give specific dates of when things are going to happen. Now, these are target dates. It's okay if things don't happen. So you could say within six months, we are going to uh, reach out to the daycare. And then within six months after that, we're going to have a plan and a program and, and within a year do a story time at that daycare. Uh, remember this plan, your strategic community needs response plan will cover at least five years. So you can actually say in two years, we are going to do this in your plan. Um, you may know I've got some other things I'm doing. I can't figure it out. I don't have the staff to do it this year in 2020, you know, the next year coming up 2024, but I'll do it in 2025. And that's okay. Uh, you know, think about it, figure out what is attainable, what is something you can actually do. Uh, and you know, just, but you do have to put down the specific target dates of when you may do the thing. It's okay if you don't meet those dates, just adjust as you go. Your strategic plan, your, stop saying that, <laughs> your community's response plan can be adjusted as you go. That's part of the evaluation too each year. You may update it and change things and realize actually something totally happened new and I had to switch gears. Um, this, like I said, should be a living document, something that you use and you refer to, but it can be tweaked. It is not hard and in stone. If you realize, oh, this daycare, their staff actually were not the right ones to work with or their staff changed and they didn't want to do it. Well, let's shift gears back up. Let's try a different one. Let's try the other daycare on the other side of town. You never know. Um, you have to be, you have to have a plan and something you're gonna do, but also be flexible. Sounds like life, didn't it? <laughs>
And then the last part of your community's response plan is your evaluation. And this is how you're going to evaluate the plan itself. So who will, um, looking at it regularly, I would suggest at least once a year, if you're not using it more often than that, to see, oh, what did we say we would do? Are we doing that? How's that going? Do we need to shift gears? Um, are things going fine? Whatever. Um, who will be on this team? Uh, I would recommend some people who created the original plan, but some who didn't have a mixture. People from the outside with the new eyes and say, and can see what you're trying to do and give their um, input. It does not to be, at, it wouldn't need to be as many people as were on your original planning team. Um, I think two or three can look at this and, and evaluate it. Um, what are you, why are you doing this? You're doing it to make sure we're keeping on track and what will you do afterwards? We will adjust as we go if necessary, those kind of things. Um, as far as your team for this and your team for your planning team in the beginning, um, this is a question that someone asked, uh, I think in yesterday's workshop, uh, about using past board members, previous board members or previous staff. Um, does it have to be your current staff only? Um, absolutely, yes, bring in people who used to work there. They may just have done some me off in another job, but they're still um, supportive of the library. Uh, I know board members have to come on and off. They may have you know, term limits, so to speak. Um, you can definitely bring in um, past board members or staff to be either on your original planning team or on this um, evaluation team if you are comfortable with that. And then our last worksheet we have here is called our Communities Response Plan Summary. And this is, it has all the different parts that are, all the different elements that are required in a plan and space for you to fill in all of them. So the dates the plan covers, um, when you started planning it, the members of the team, the demographic info and information about your community, et cetera, et cetera. So if you fill in, answer each one of these sections and have something in each, each of these parts, you will have a community's response plan. This has all those seven elements in it. So this can be your, your template to work with. And as long as you fill in all of this, based on all that information and research you did, you've got a plan. So this is something if you want to use it. If you want to just use another library's plan as your template, feel free to do that as well. There is no rule about the, the format and how it looks and what's in it. Um, the only rules is these seven things are in it somewhere. You will see some of these plans have a cover sheet and a table of contents and whatnot, and some don't. Up to you what you feel like you, how you want yours to look and how it works and um, what you are comfortable with. And so that is all the parts of the plan. Um, anybody have any questions about community needs response planning? Um, what was confusing? What were you hoping I would cover that I didn't? What uh, would you like to know more about or something you would like to see? Uh, type into the question section. We have about 10 minutes left in our allotted time for the workshop. So we have plenty of time to answer any questions you have um, about this or about anything accreditation. Um, hmm. Awesome question that just came in that I didn't, that is, yeah, I did not mention it. Someone wants to know, is there a spot where we report out on the last plan or compare? Uh, so that is not something that we have as a requirement here is um, there's not some a section that says that you don't have to report to me, hey, here, we did the thing and it worked out. Or we didn't do the thing or we did. Uh, but we changed gears, and ended up doing this instead, whatever. Um, <laughs> and so, so that is, and it does seem weird that we don't require that. That's just not something we ask for. We just ask you to create this plan and do it. Uh, so we don't have a, okay, now that you've done this, you have to send me a report. Like when you've applied for a grant and you say, we're going to do this project, we gave you the money, and then you tell us what, that you did it. We don't have that last part of telling us what you did. No, it is not required. Um, however, if you want to, please do include that um, in your plan. Like when you're talking about your goals, um, you can say, we did previously have this as the goal and we completed it this far and that was great. And that made us think of a new idea. So because of that previous goal, now we're doing this new thing. Or we had this goal before and it didn't happen and we want to do it again. That's okay. 
too. So if you had a previous goal and for whatever reasons like COVID, as was mentioned here, or natural disaster like the floods we had in Nebraska, things had to be totally, you know, switch gears and now we're doing nothing this year except for cleaning up after the flood. <laughs> or we're doing nothing this year because we're shut down for COVID. That's okay. You can say that in your next plan and say, here's what happened and here's why we didn't do it, but we'd like to try again. So we're gonna start fresh and that's our goal. Um, and that's okay. Um, so if you want to, you can, I'd, I'd love to hear about what you have done. Um, it's not a requirement. If you think you did a great program, you just want to send me an email or something and say, look what happened. I would love to hear about it, but no, there's not a requirement for that. Um, there's not a requirement, but if a previous goal informed your new goal or influenced a new one, or was the reason why you did something, definitely let me know so I can see that. Um, I do compare your new plan to your previous one as well. So you can't just submit the same plan all over again. I'll obviously look at the uh, census data. The numbers have to be different. They have to be current. Um, you don't want to use 10-year-old census data. The last time many of you did this five years or more ago, we're probably using the 10, 10, uh, 2010 census numbers. You don't want to use those this year or anytime soon. Those are too old. They aren't, they aren't useful. They're useful for showing a change over time. Sure, if you want to say in 2010 it was this, and now in 2020 we know it's this, and here's what we've learned from that, that's okay, but you've got to have those newer numbers. I will look at your goals and make sure you didn't just repeat the same exact thing and, and didn't explain why you were repeating it. Um, you can't, I don't want you to have all the same three goals if you want to. You know, you've got to come up with something new, at least one thing new this year. Uh, so I do compare to your previous plan to make sure it's not just a duplicate. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead and ask me anything. I'm going to keep talking about this a little bit. But I want to also explain, yes, how I do evaluate this. Like I said, I look at your plan, um, your previous plan. I look at your application form, the online form, and make sure it all matches up. That Anything you've mentioned here, you've checked off on the form. Anything you've checked off on the form you've mentioned in your plan. Um, I may reach out to you if I notice that a part of your plan is lacking, it is not, um, or um, it's either missing entirely or is really small and doesn't have all the data, I may send it back to you and say, okay, we need to expand here more before I can approve approve it. Or you, the numbers in your community profile are actually your 2010 numbers. I think you might have forgotten to update those things like that, I will send them back to you. And we will have a be back and forth. I'll send it back to you, you can change it, send me a new one, and it will work back and forth until we have something we can agree on. If you want me to look at a draft of this before you consider it final, definitely send that to me, I can look at it, um, or just a part of it, I can look at it. If you wanna work with your um, regional library system directors, they can do that too, send it to them and have another set of eyes look at it too. Um, so we can have a back and forth before you send me, well, here's what I think is the final one. Let me know if anything needs to be changed, and I will do so. So the plan and the application form, as I've mentioned, are what you need to submit. They are not in stone. Things can be changed. Um, all right, we have a few minutes left. Five, Six minutes left here. Uh, what other questions do you did you do you want to ask me about accreditation? Um, anything about it? Is there anything I didn't cover that you were hoping I would ask me about it? Is there something you would like a little more explanation on that I was too quick on or that I didn't explain in in depth for you? Um, let me know. Go ahead and type in your questions section. We've got five more minutes here. I will answer any questions you all have. All right, it looks like you don't have any desperate, urgent questions to ask now, that's okay. Um, you all know where to find me, email me, um, call if you have any questions as you're working on this. Um, like I said, the process officially opens in July with the application form going live for you. Uh, you will all get an email from me letting you know that you have been invited if you're up for reaccreditation this year or if you are unaccredited and have done your form, your public library survey, I'll email you all. Uh, but you can start working on that community's response plan right now. 
Um, you could have been already working on it. Uh, you don't have to wait to do that. That you can work on um, whenever you want to. So start working on that. If you have any issues, questions, you want more, more about what you're doing, let me look at it, uh, reach out to me. Um, both your final version of that form and your application are due October 1st at the very latest. And um, by December 31st, I will let uh, everyone will know if they are accredited or not. All right, so uh, since we don't see any questions coming in, that is it for our uh, Public Library Accreditation 2023 workshop. Thank you everybody for being here. And um, we will have a recording of this available soon, I'll say. <laughs> um, it will need some editing and whatnot and posting it up, but as soon as it's available, I will announce on our usual page places, um, mailing list, uh, blog, social media, etc. when it is out there. So if you wanted to rewatch it, you could. Uh, if you had any other staff or board members or people that you want to learn about accreditation so that you can um, get them on board to help you out, you can watch that recording. Um, I'm also going to show you here, I'm going to click here, right now it says the workshops are open for registration, but this now also has a link to, I did do an Encompass Live a short introduction to um, public library accreditation process that I did um, last month. No, a few weeks ago, May 10th. Eh, time flies. So if uh, you want someone to watch something shorter than this three hour workshop, this is just a little over an hour long, gives you an overview a more a short introduction to the program and the process. So if you have someone who just needs this, send them to that recording and they can watch that. Um, eventually, the three-hour recording of this session will be available, and they'll both be linked here from the accreditation page for um, you to rewatch or you to send off to anyone else, like I said, who you think um, should watch it. All right, I don't see any other, any other questions that came in while I was babbling away here, so I think we'll wrap up our workshop. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Reach out to me with any questions or uh, issues you have. And good luck with your uh, public library accreditation this year. Bye-bye.